live. All right, it is six o'clock. Today is Wednesday, February 10th. Welcome folks to the February 10th, 2021 edition of HRPB. Uh, Ms. Cole, can you do a roll call from where you are? I sure can. Um, Keith, my video is not on. I don't know, it says, is that me that stopped it because of my new stuff or no? You should come oh, on. Okay. <laughs> okay, gotcha, okay. Um, all right, Bill Felkamp? Here. Bob Dorenzo? Present. Uh, Judy Fox? Here. Chip Guthrie? Here. Jeff? Here. We're getting shorter, <laughs> getting shorter, shorter. <laughs> and Steve? Here. <laughs> and you have a quorum. Wonderful, thank you very much. Can those of us who are here rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice, and justice for all. Thank you. 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 Will there be any additions, deletions, or reordering tonight? Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman. Uh, tonight we will um, have the addition of one item, um, and that is going to be a conceptual review for the property located at 807 North Ocean Breeze, um, and we would like to place that as item C under new business. 807 North Ocean Breeze, and this is a an informal hearing on that? Yes, sir. So this is a, a conceptual review brought to us by the homeowner um, just to kind of get a, um, um, a take on, on their request to see if you all have any recommendations or concerns with the project before it moves forward. Hmm. Interesting. All right. Uh, any other uh, reorderings? Uh, no, Mr. Chairman. Okay. I do see that we are doing the presentation on flood adaptations before we do um, uh, the single family addition, is that because this is a teachable moment and it's better to get the uh, presentation on flood adaptation out of the way first? Um, item, um, item B, or excuse me, the, uh, the floodplain um, presentation does have some bearing on item B. Um, in addition to that, um, Peter Ringel, the city's building official, will be giving that presentation this evening, and, and he's still in the office. So we would like to get Peter out as soon as possible. Okay. All righty. That's it. Can I have a motion for approval of the agenda? I move that we approve the agenda as amended, adding C-807 North Ocean, uh, North Ocean Breeze. Accepted. Moved and seconded. All in favor, aye. 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 Okay. Uh, approval of the minutes. So can I get an approval of the minutes of the last meeting? I move to approve the minutes from the meeting of January, whatever the date was, January okay. 2021. Approved by a, a motion made by Mr. Harris. Second. Seconded by Mr. Pickett. All in favor, aye. 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 Uh, passes. All right, swearing in of staff and applicants, Ms. Cole. Do you plan to give testimony this evening? Do we have everybody over? Um, Keith, do we have any applicants? Um, Christina and Rolanda? Yes. Okay. You have two. I believe, I know Rolanda is. Um, I don't, okay. Yes. Um, can you have them coming over now. Swearing in. If you can turn on your video and unmute, please. Okay. Okay, wonderful. Okay, please raise your right hand if you plan to give testimony this evening. Do you swear and affirm the testimony you will give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? If so, say yes. 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 Thank you. All right. We have proof of publication. And let's go directly to board disclosures. Anyone have any disclosures on 
Nothing. Oh, oh, project. No. Okay. Yeah, Mr. Harris will recuse himself right when it comes to uh, the new business number B. So let's go uh, right into unfinished business item A, HRPB project uh, at 418 North Ocean Breeze. Take it away. All right. Okay. Is it on the present correct screen? It looks like it is, Abe. Okay. All right, so just a quick recap um, in unfinished business, we're looking at consideration of a certificate of appropriateness for the construction of a new six, plus or minus 619 square foot accessory building for the new single family residence at 418 North Ocean Breeze. Um, this item was reviewed last month and the board requested additional drawings to illustrate the scale height and visibility of the proposed accessory structure in relation to the existing home on the parcel. So on the following slides, we have the new drawings um, the project manager submitted. With that being said, I will turn it over to him since we, we did do our staff presentation last month. Keith, if you can bring over Christina, please. Don't, I don't think it looks like you have them on here. Keith, could you please bring over um, Christina? Um, unfortunately, I don't have, I don't seem to have uh, access to um, move them over. Perfect. Thank you. All right. And it looks like you guys are muted. All right. Can you hear me now? Yeah. So um, I put all your exhibits in these slides. So you just let me know when you want me to turn to the next slide. All right. Please state your name as also for the record and um, your your relationship, you know, why you're here, all that other good stuff, you know. Okay. Um, my name is Scott Ehrenberg and my company is Berg Design and I'm the uh, project representative for Christina uh, Horvat and uh, I'm sorry, McLeod and, uh, and her mother, uh, Hil okay. Hilka Horvat. <laughs> So um, with that being said, to pick up on the uh, presentation, I uh, mentioned that I appreciate that uh, we continue this. So we have the opportunity to give you this additional presentation. Obviously every project is different and I appreciate you taking the time to, to understand. Um, if we could actually switch to drawing H2, um, Abraham, thank you. This is, um, an expanded drawing of the one that I had included in the first round. And if you look at the, um, for what I can see on the far right, there's um, a, a low end of a line that projects from about six feet above where somebody would be standing on the sidewalk across the street. And that line projects over the existing house and towards a scale of where the new house would be. Um, in the backyard, and you can see that line is way above um, that proposed structure. So that was one of the ways that I was trying to explain to you that if you're anywhere in front of the existing house on North Ocean Breeze, you just cannot see the new structure. Um, if you could then switch to the um, site plan that I have with the red line, there we go. The only place that you could possibly see any part of the house in the back is on that, what would be from the street, um, looking at the property, the left side, um, the far left side. And um, if you look to the right of it, where the red intersects with the proposed in-law house, I drew a line where the right edge or the edge of 
the, um, the half round windows were proposing would be, and then projected across to um, the existing house and the house next door to try and see if there's any sight line at all. And if you notice, I, I shaded one in black and one in red, and the sight lines actually cross over in between the two properties. And from what I can tell, you really need to be past that location to either see, to be able to see this window. So if you're gonna see it, you're either barely gonna see it from across the street or you're barely not gonna see it until you actually get to that point of the property. So that's what my, you know, I appreciate your board and what your um, venue or whatever is as far as um, trying to regulate the visual aspects of the buildings on this area and there's very, there's, if there's any, there's almost no visual aspect from the front of this new structure um, from North Ocean Breeze. Um, if you would then go to the um, photographs that uh, show the uh, left side view of the yard, which is on the left of my screen. And the top photo is actually taken from across the street and that's where that red and black sight line would, would be. So either you're barely gonna see something well above six feet on that building in the back, um, because there's fence, there's shrubs, there's everything six feet or below would be blocked um, from those sight lines. Anything that's above six feet that you might be able to see would be there as far as the window. And then as you proceed down on the left side, you will see more of the building, but again, above six feet, you might see part of the screen porch and you might see part of the roof. Um, on the right side, you see the right side of the subject property and you see looking there, you have, again, no real sight line of the new structure. And in the lowest photo, you look down their driveway and you see the building in the rear of their house, um, which is not up for question. Um, and so that's the basic presentation. I did also include drawing H1 and H1 I brought up, um, I did on the left side or the middle diagrams, it shows keeping the half round window but changing the roof pitch in the lower picture to a 512 pitch, in the upper picture to a 712 pitch. Um, the 512 pitch does actually make the roof line the same as the existing structure within inches. And um, in order to accomplish that, we had to drop the floor height, but we kept the nine foot wall height. Um, the 712 pitch would be if you wanted to maybe come up with a compromise and not keep the 912 pitch that we originally proposed. And then on the right hand side, I have, um, again, potential compromises with the 512 pitch with a transom window. And I showed the height of the transom window at 14 inches. And just so that we had the comparison to maybe get a little more glass area on the 712 pitch in the top right, um, I have the front elevation with an 18 inch transom. Um, so those are those are basically what I provided for new drawings to try and tell the story so you could get a better understanding. And I guess now at this point, it's up to uh, your opinion on it. Okay, thank you. Are there questions from board members? Uh, just one quick question. That the, the site plan section, that's drawn to scale, right? The buildings are the correct distance apart? Yes, that's based on a survey. Okay, and is and is the pitch on that one then uh, the the completed pitch on the on the back building? Is that a nine twelve pitch? Um, and drawing H two, it shows the original nine twelve pitch. Correct. Okay. All right. And then, the, so then the second pitch should and down. You were saying a, site plan, but Abraham well, I'm just saying it's, it's a site two. section, right? But. The, um, the second the second roof pitch down that's only half complete, that's a 712, is that right? Um, I actually, that would be um, the cathedral inside. 
that was not altered for this um, purpose. It was um, that it would be half of the nine twelve pitch, which would be a four and a half twelve pitch, which was for the cathedral inside. I think so. Actually, I'm not one hundred percent sure because it looks like it matches the seven twelve pitch as I look at it. Sherry, should we, um, Susan, maybe you can, Susan, when should we hear public comment? Should, before the board goes into discussion of questions, should we hear public comment? I, I, I have one more question, though. I also, I'm just curious, because you've drawn the, um, you've drawn the scissor truss bottom cord in both elevations, both front elevations with the, with the uh, half round window. Um, why did you not draw it on the other side? Um, did I take it out of, you're saying on the yeah, I'm, front I'm elevations with the transoms, I don't show the bottom cord? That's right. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just wondering if that means that's a flat ceiling. Or... It's undetermined. Um, but on this drawing H1, on the section B, um, the lower section is showing a 712 pitch and the upper section I mean, is the lower section is showing a 512 pitch and the upper section is showing a 712 pitch right, right. that was done clearly to show um, the relationships and the height are there other questions from board members yeah mr chairman yes sir. Uh, got a question regarding the trees and vegetation you know, looking from the front on the left side, the house to the north, is that tree going to have to be removed? Um, or I know there's some larger trees on the property. Just I'm just thinking visual from the street. Oh, that's, this tree? No, that's staying. You want to keep that? No, that tree's there. Yeah, that large tree that's visible on the left is the intent is to keep it. Okay, and then there are some large trees in the back. There's. Uh, I'm just saying, what's going to be removed in the back as far as uh, the house? No there trees. are some trees or not? There's, there's really no trees that we're going to take out. We're basically putting it right in a spot where there's no trees. Okay. No, I'm just, yeah. just, just a question. Right. So both, to clarify, both the house and the potential swimming pool are intended to be put in without uh, um, affecting the larger trees. Okay. That was All my right. question. Is that correct? Yeah. Good question, Mr. Dorenzo. Other board questions? If not, let's move on to public comment, as Aaron suggested. Is there any public comment on this project? Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, this is Sherry. Yes, I do have one um, public comment that was submitted um, via email, and it comes from um, a neighbor, 414 North Ocean Breeze. Uh, the silver blats, and they have stated that the um, the project to be located in the backyard, uh, they are adjacent homeowners at 414 North Ocean Breeze, and they agree with the staff and board's recommendation for the height of the accessory structure to be lower than or equal to the height of the primary structure, and that is their um, that is their concern. Thank you very much, Ms. Cole. You're welcome. Any other comments from the public? Hearing none, the board will go into an executive session, realizing that uh, the conditions of approval that are suggested by our staff, number nine, the fan light window should be altered to a four light transom, and number 10, the height of the accessory structure to be lower than or equal to the height of the primary structure. So if an approval motion is made, Subject to those conditions, uh, that's what will be proposed. So I wasn't here last week. I guess I have to recuse myself. I mean, I wasn't in on the original discussion on this. I don't know what the rule is on that. Yeah, is our attorney is our attorney online? Uh, is is uh, Miss Fox uh, suggested to recuse herself because she was not in on the project last week? Yes or no? Um, 
I don't think it's it's absolutely required, but the question would be, does she feel she can, having missed the public hearing previously, um, if she can, can vote on it based on the information that she has? Not necessarily, I don't think so. Okay. She is not comfortable making a decision on what she has heard. So Ms. Fox has asked to recuse herself. Are there, okay, we're in session. Any other comments or thoughts from board members? Um, well, I have a comment regarding the, the higher ceiling, scissor trust ceiling in that one element of that, of the project. Um, it seems to me that it seems to me that that dormer, there's no reason why that dormer could not be a steeper pitch than what it's shown as. It doesn't have to follow the pitch of the primary roof. There are many examples of dormers being completely different mm -hmm. pitches of, of the existing main roof of the house. I would think if that, if that pitch were raised slightly, then the transom window would be, certainly would have clearance to anything underneath it. And, uh, and possibly could even be made a little bit taller. Um, I, I firmly believe that the, the arched window is, is just not, it's out of place. Yeah. And also, I just think that the arch windows now look horrible, basically. They look, in my personal opinion, seeing them on all sorts of different size projects, they look just cheesy because the mutton bars, everything about them is so thin and fake looking that um, it winds up, the, the window itself just winds up looking terrible. It's funny, That's, Mr. Harris, cheesy was exactly the word that I was going to use. <laughs> well, all right, exactly. and we didn't talk about this prior to this. So. But, but anyhow, I'm just saying that it, it, they just, they look inadequate for a, for a nice project. This little building, I think, is a nice project. I, I think it fundamentally is a, is a good project. I just think that that window would really, really detract from it. And it makes it once again look, you know, less than elegant, less than as elegant as it could be. The other thing I want to say is I also believe that if the roof pitch, if the roof pitch of the dormer were changed a little bit, I, I think that would, um, I think we could drop this, the roof down to 712 rather than 912 and, uh, and still have um, adequate space. I, one thing I also will say, and I know this isn't well, Delray, but Delray Beach has a, a different way of looking yeah. at the elevations of the buildings. I know our rule is written one way, theirs is another, but theirs actually, uh, their, their elevation, their height rule is based on something similar than the drawing to the drawing shown in H2, where it's, um, there's a viewpoint given across the street and that creates the, the basically the bulk plane for what you can see. And, and then there's some other calculations you do. But um, I think that, I, I think that if we, I, I think that we're within um, a reasonable viewpoint to go ahead and let the guy raise the roof to 712 and not worry about a 912. So that's my feeling. I would move to support the building with a 712 pitch and a, and a higher dormer. Well, can I get clarification? Is seven is 712 going to make the peak of the subordinate structure higher than the peak of the uh, of the front structure? Yes, it will. No, it, it'll definitely it'll do that because it's it's probably roughly shown by whether that's the interior scissor truss or not. I think that's probably roughly 712, and so you can see that it's. So I'm not. I'm, well, no, maybe that's. I don't know. Maybe that's a yeah. 512. I, I, I would. I would. I with that. I think that. Uh, the, uh, the easiest solution is the height should be equal to or less than the height of the main roof. However, however, you have, a, you have a little subordinate thought that the uh, uh, the dormer over that front window could be a bit steeper, and I have no problem with that. And that could be handled administratively, but I think that it, the important thing is to maintain the overall height as being equal to or less than the height of the main house. That is what I believe subordinate to the um, to the structure in front means. It has to be smaller in footprint, and also, you know. Uh, That's right. No, and I, you know, I uh, again, I completely understand that. I mean, but uh, as the board, we do have a little leeway to allow projects to create to have a slightly larger footprint or slightly taller roof or slightly different detail. Uh, all I'm saying is. I, I think he's tried to make this thing as low as he can 
given the fact that he's raising it up to meet the flood levels. And uh, so what I'm saying is I, I don't think a 712 compromise is that big a deal. I think that's a significant change. It's, it's really unfortunate that he didn't draw it that way in relation to the front building again. I mean, there's- Are there two different pitches? If you look at the top um, um, items, the, uh, the that's, that's two different pitches on the dormer. Am I still on? Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Um, in drawing H1, section B co correctly reflects the 512 pitch at the bottom and the 712 pitch at the top. And so, then the bottom, and then the bottom one is is um, five and twelve on the top, and four and twelve, four and twelve on the bottom. On the on the dormer. No, on H one, I know I made it um, the correct height because I used that to create what's on the right. So at the bottom, where the bottom pitch on the the elevation is five twelve. The right hand slope on the section B is 512. On the top where the right elevations are 712, the slope on the rafter on the, on the section B is 712. And um, in logic and in what I recall, the, um, the 912 is about four feet above the existing structure. The 512 is about even to the existing structure. And the 712 is about two feet. It's a it's pretty much an average um, compromise. I know I would okay. I would think that it's in my mind it's more important to get the the building to look right and to make it work the right way than being stuck on um, making sure that it's at the same height or lower than the primary building. And I say that with because of the fact of the flood, the flood heights have changed. And I know that this particular building is a little bit higher than what the, the code actually calls for, but um, I'm not as concerned with, especially seeing the viewpoint and seeing how far back it is in the property with it being absolutely lower than the primary building as opposed to making sure that the roof line and the, the, the elements of the, of the facade work. Mm -hmm. Mr. Um, just to point out since, since you mentioned the floodplain, um, this also I've accounted for eliminating the uh, foot above NABD. So I brought the floor level even with the existing structure. So if you're going to allow us to get that foot of NABD back, um, even with the 512 pitch, we can't match the existing structure without, well, we decided we had to lose one, either the wall height or the floor height. So we decided to lose the floor height and keep the nine foot wall height. Well, if you lose the floor height, does that not put you in variance with the code requirements? No, it, it just meets it instead of exceeding it. When you say it just meets it, you mean it, what flood zone is this? Uh, seven, I think. Or nine. We can go back on that. I don't know. We, we can, these are, this area is typically in an AE zone with a, a base flood elevation. Um, we actually, in the next, we have the floodplain administrator on, he can look it up, but typically right. this area is in an AE zone with a minimum base flood elevation. So what the applicant is saying is that they meet the base flood of elevation plus one foot one of freeboard, foot. which is required. Right, right. And, that's, so, and you're saying that's what you have now. It's base flood plus one for the, for the floor of the building, the new building. That's what's required by the Florida Building Code. So that's what they've had to propose. They've proposed, and my correct me if I'm wrong, but they've proposed originally base flood plus two. So they're a foot above what they need for three board. But we took that out in order to meet the existing height. So I'm looking at what's on the screen. The required is nine NABD. What we were going to do is 10. Now we brought it down to nine. So the drawings reflect the nine foot NABD, which does meet the requirement. And we're keeping the nine foot wall height. And if we do the 512 pitch, we will match the existing structure within inches of overall height. Seems to me that we need uh, someone from engineering to look at this and determine whether it is legal for you to go back down to nine. Um, 
it's not really our call at the moment. So um, as the applicant has stated, the nine NAVD is the minimum standard that he was given by the floodplain administrator, Peter Rangel, who can speak to that. He needs okay. to meet that. Oh, okay. um, uh, so, so let me go, just, I can go see Peter's in the building. I don't know if he's listening at this point, but he's here. So this is what he said is required is, um, I think this is our staff presentation. So we checked with Peter, who is our floodplain administrator. This is what is required for this property. Originally, what was proposed is the 10 NAVD. So um, what you all said was that you were going to require a maximum overall height. And so they had a choice between reducing the wall height or lowering the structure. And they chose to keep the wall height higher and lower the base of the structure. Yeah. Gotcha. This is, these were requests from the homeowner. The homeowner wanted to go a foot above the required NAVD and she wanted to have a nine foot wall height. So during, since the last meeting, we were working on getting the, the roof height to match. And I told her we have to, you know, one or the other has to go. So she decided she wanted to keep the nine foot wall height and go down on the NAVD, but we're not, we're, we're meeting code. There's no okay. zoning issue. There's no code issues. The only issue is the visibility from the street and whatever the historic uh, just uh, governs. Can we, um, can we all agree that the wind, that the uh, fan window is out in the, is that, is that consensus, Bob? Yes, yes transom. <laughs> okay, so that, so all we're really we're talking about now is the difference right. in the pitch of the roof to either bring the peak to the same, if not lower than the front house or within an inch, I mean, if it's an inch or two higher um, or allow it to go the compromise of a 712, which would bring it two feet above the pitch in the front. I've heard different views um, on it. My preference would be to follow the subordinate, which is what staff recommended. And that's what their neighbor, apparently the people right next door would rather see the, the uh, the elevation is the same because, you know, they're not looking at it from the street. They're looking at it from the side. Mm -hmm. And that's something I think we should consider too. And those are our guidelines. I would tend to agree with you. Uh, I have one, but I would keep my Oh, that's right. <laughs> Mr. Dorenzo, comments? You know, I, I tend to lean towards Jeff. I, I wouldn't be opposed to a little bit of a compromise because of the fact that it sits in the rear of the structure. We're not touching any of the large vegetation which would impede any of the views and all of that um and, and those transom windows in the top right the larger ones the 18 inch that that look is correct so i'm, I'm basically agreeing with what jeffrey um was discussing prior okay would someone like to make a motion then All right, I'll make it. I would, I would move to approve the design with conditions. Condition A is that the transom window um, is the window of choice for the front line. Oh, okay, here, let me see. Let me see. Uh, so we have them on the screen. So really the ones that guys are looking to change are potentially nine and 10. Keeping nine, it sounds like, and deciding on 10. Right. Okay. All right. So I would say I move to approve the project with the conditions of approval, specifically item 10, that the uh, height of the, extress of the accessory structure be slightly higher than the existing house through the use of a 712 pitch. And you get that a maximum height of two feet above the existing home? Yeah, I guess. Mr. I, Harris, I believe the applicant stated that the 712 pitch was approximately two feet higher than the principal structure. So if you wanted to add the word by approximately two feet for additional guidance to staff, that, that I, would be appropriate. I, I will, yeah, okay. I will do that. Mr. Harris, do you want to restate that item then? Okay, I uh, move to approve the project as drawn with the existing conditions of approval. However, changing item 10 
the height of the, of the accessory structure shall be made lower by the use of a 712 pitch rather than a 912, which should reduce the height of the overall building by approximately two feet. No, I don't think that's what you're going to say. Or you would be increasing above. the height of the building by approximately two feet. Well, yeah. Above the existing. Are going to restate that? Or, or... Yes. So it would be the, so Mr. Harris, I believe you're making a motion to approve um, the project, but you are suggesting that uh, the condition 10 be amend, amended so that the accessory structure should have a 712 roof pitch and that the maximum height of the accessory structure shall be uh, um, approx no greater than approximately two feet higher than the primary structure. Is that correct? I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> as stated, as stated. As stated. <laughs> Second on that. Second. Seconded by Mr. Pickett. Any more discussion? Um, does that allow us to do the dormer at a 912 pitch? Yeah, as long as it doesn't, as long as it doesn't go higher than the uh, ridge line. Very good, thank you. I don't, you know, it's, it, it, I'm, into, I'm okay with compromise too. I mean, you're there, but I, I was. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor of, of the motion? Aye. 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 As opposed, nay, nay, one nay. Motion carries four to one, I guess. Yeah, four to one. Let's move on to. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Yep, thank you, sir. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Let's move on to new business item A presentation on flood adaptation in the city's historic district by Mr. Peter Ringel. Are you on board? So that is actually, I'm going to, this is going to be a multi, um, a, a multi person presentation this evening. We're going to break out all the stops for you. Awesome. Um, <laughs> so um, I'll go ahead and get everything started. Let me just orient myself here. Um, so this is this presentation uh, will include uh, Preeta Rangel, who is not only our building official, but he is our floodplain administrator, which we're very lucky to have in-house. Saves a lot of time for um, our folks who want to uh, move forward with their projects. And then Jordan Hodges, uh, who is on our staff and, and he's our preservation manager, will also um, uh, present a section of the uh, presentation this evening. So I'm gonna go ahead and get us started. And um, so as you may have guessed from the agenda item, we are talking about flood and flood maps and base flood elevations and all kinds of fun stuff that I know you guys are really excited about. Um, <clears throat> so first, just as a primer for not only yourselves, but um, there may be folks listening um, uh, online and who may not be familiar with this subject. Um, the National Flood Insurance Program, this is a program that is administered by uh, FEMA or the Federal Emergency Management Agency. And uh, the flood mapping, flood mapping is an important component of the National Flood Insurance, flood insurance Program. <laughs> and it is the basis for FEMA's flood regulations and flood insurance requirements. Now for compliance with this program, what the city does is we review new construction and renovation projects for compliance with the program requirements. The city also participates in the community rating system. And part of our participation in the community rating system, um, a lot, we basically get a value or rating from FEMA and that um, allows us to get discounts for our residents on their flood insurance. Right now, our current rating is a seven, which entitles a uh, <clears throat> Lake Worth Beach residents to a 15% premium discount. So what is the community rating system? I know you, this is a burning question in your mind this evening that we're going to help answer for you. <laughs> and this is a voluntary incentive program. And what it does is it recognizes and encourages floodplain management practices in local governments. Um, and it, it encourages these practices that exceed the minimum standards. There are approximately 1,500 communities nationwide that participate in this program. Lake Worth Beach is one of those communities. Um, in CRS communities, obviously, we get the discounted rates. <clears throat> There's also other efforts like um, public outreach, um, education, um, additional regulations regarding floodplain requirements. Um, all of these lead into the goal of the three goals of the program which are 
to reduce and avoid flood damage to insurable property, strengthen and support um, the insur insurable assets um, of the um, NFIP, and to also foster comprehensive floodplain management within the United States. So now that we've given you the big picture, which is, was kind of my role this evening, we're gonna roll out our multi, um, <clears throat> our multi presenter presentation. And here are the things we're gonna talk about this evening. So first off, some of you may be aware or not that uh, FEMA issued some new firm maps in January of 2020. So we're gonna um, talk about um, the applicability of the maps and all of that good stuff. Peter's gonna discuss that um, as our certified floodplain manager. We're also gonna discuss what is base, elevate, base flood elevation and when do we need an elevated structure? Also important word to know, what is a substantial improvement? And then finally, um, how does historic preservation um, and the NFIP, how do those work together? And um, lastly, I'm gonna wrap up with a very brief discussion on sustainability and coastal resilience. So I'm going to go ahead and turn over the, the next part of the presentation to Peter, unless you all had any questions for me. Peter, take it away. Okay, so the, the, as Aaron stated, the new maps uh, were rolled out in January of 2020. They are not currently effective but um, with the maps, they sent a letter stating that because the maps were based on the latest study data, that we have to enforce the um, new map information. So um, based on that, um, that's why we're enforcing the new maps, even though they haven't been adopted yet. When they do get adopted, um, there's gonna be some rather significant changes. Okay, um, most everything east of Federal Highway is going to be in a flood zone. And that's a big change from before. And we're gonna show you some of those pictures of the map. Um, so here we have the large picture of the map. Um, and again, the maps uh, since January, 2020, um, the what they did is they went and they did coastline studies, wave runups, um, all the way around the entire coastline of Florida. So every map panel that touches the Atlantic or the Gulf was is given new maps. So um, in Palm Beach County, there are 38 different um, sectional views that were studied for uh, wave action. And so that's why we have the new maps. Um, next slide, please. So this is a picture of the downtown. The map on the left is the old map, okay? The pink shaded region is the AE flood zone or the 100 year flood zone. The yellow or orange yellow is the 500 year flood zone. Now, if we go to the map on the right, they change the, the colors and the designations on the map. But if you look at the 100 year flood zone, it's going another block further west than it was before. So now the 500 year flood zone is touching a lot of South Federal Highway. And the 100 year flood zone is going all the way to Ocean Breeze. And, and something else that's new on this map that was not included on the previous map is you have the black line with the arrows and that's called the Limwa. And what that means is in those areas, in a hundred year flood, you, you can expect one to three foot wave action in those areas. Uh, what that means is no shallow foundations, no structural fill under the homes. The other thing that went up is um, the elevations, okay? The uh, last house we just spoke about, their current flood elevation on the map would have been a six and now they're at an eight. So it went up two feet from what was there. So the average elevations went up between two and three feet, depending upon where you are in the city. Here's a look at College Park before and after. Same thing, you know, the flood goes a lot farther west. So if you look at the map, basically 
What was in the 500 year flood zone is now in the 100 year flood zone. And we're talking about many, many hundreds of houses that are being added to the, um, will be an added to the insurance rolls once these maps become effective. And the other thing that's going to happen is the um, houses that are in the flood zone are now going to be non-compliant because they're raising the elevation two feet. So we have a picture of the South Palm Park before and after. And same story, except here on the south end, the 500-year uh, flood zone is actually going west of Federal Highway. So that, that's a really big change. And there are some parcels um, that actually now have a base flood elevation of 11 feet on the south end. So, you know, it's rather significant. And you've got the, uh, the wave action line going quite a bit. Uh, you know, inland. If we go to the next slide, you can look at um, base flood elevation. And what base flood elevation, it means the finished floor. Okay. So um, with the Florida building code, they've mandated that everybody in the state of Florida does base flood elevation plus one foot. It used to be a local ordinance. Now it's throughout the state of Florida. And there's a big difference in insurance premiums between a house that's at base flood elevation, a house that's base flood plus one, or a house that's base flood minus one. So it's a rather significant um, uh, uh, difference in insurance premiums. And Peter, I, I think on the slide, I didn't want us to forget bullet one, which is that when you're in the 100 year floodplain, that doesn't mean you're gonna house may flood once every 100 years. That's really that they have a 1% chance every year of, of, and if you can explain that a little bit more. Yeah, so the, what the 100 year uh, flood event is, um, earlier at the late part of last year, we had three 100 year flood events in the span of three months. So we actually had you know, some flooding here in, in the city of Lake Worth Beach, especially on the south end. And so we had 300 year events in one year. It just means you have a 1% chance every year of having a hundred year flood, but it doesn't mean, you know, just like we learned in 2004, we had two hurricanes hit Palm Beach County. So you can have a hundred year event more than once every hundred years. Um, and it doesn't also mean that your flood, that because there is a hundred year event that your house will flood. I think that's important to note. You know, yes. the, the, your risk is determined on your individual property by your height, um, you know, the, the structure's height, the finished floor elevation height, and a, and a number of other things. So the topography in the area, all of that good stuff. And with flooding, your best friend is elevation, elevation, elevation. The higher your house is, the less uh, uh, chance there is that you will have flooding. So um, this slide here shows the 100 year still water elevation. And then you have wave action of one to three feet, okay? Um, if you are in a VE zone or a wave zone, the base flood elevation is measured to the lowest horizontal member of the building. So if you have grade beams or you have, um, uh, uh, floor joists, those floor joists must be one foot above the crest of the wave. So that is built in. That's why you have some VE 11s in the city now, because they're wanting you to elevate the bottom of the structure to 11 feet. So if you're in a VE zone, that's the lowest horizontal member. And um, something... Peter. Go ahead. Before, you, uh, before you go on, people are here in 11 feet, and if they're at home, they may be freaking out because uh, they're like, oh, we're, we need to raise it 11 feet from the ground. But that doesn't mean 11 feet from the ground. Where, how do you, where is our ground? What elevation is our ground just generally in the city? So with your um, elevation, okay, your king tides are at five feet and AVD. 
that gives you an idea of what a king tide is. So, um, you know, your normal zero NAVD is the average of mean, uh, 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 it's just a measurement point. So, you know, you're, you're, if you're at 11 feet, you're at five feet above a king tide. If you're at eight feet, you're three feet above a king tide. So, you know, that just gives you a little more idea of what, you know, the elevation we're talking about. Most of the areas in the city, the houses are currently um, around seven feet is a good average for your finished floor elevation. That's what the flood elevation was for ages from when the maps were rolled out until the new maps were adopted was uh, seven feet for most of the areas in Lake Worth Beach. And I, I think depending on, you were mentioning before, like, I mean, it varies within the city, but what's a ballpark of like the ground, the actual ground? How high is that? Like just a rough- Most places would average between five and six, um, you know, depending, you know, upon the topography, but that kind of gives you a little idea of what, where it's at. But, um, you know, it's very, it, it varies. So um, all building improvements, new buildings or improvement projects where you're doing an addition, um, they will need to elevate, you know, and Jordan's gonna talk about historic exemptions but basically, if you have a new home, you have to bring it up to the current flood elevation, depending upon your property address. Um, if you're doing an addition and the addition is a substantial improvement, that needs to be elevated, both the addition and the old house. So I'll give you a couple examples of what a substantial improvement is, okay? The FEMA definition of substantial improvement is if what you're doing exceeds 50% of the market value of the structure pre-improvement, then you must elevate the structure to the new flood elevation. So, ex you know, for example, um, if you take a house and you take it all the way down to the studs, um, you're more than likely going to be a substantial improvement and you're going to need to bring it to the new elevation. Um, now, does the market value of the structure include the land or is no, the land separate? It is just the market value of the building. And it's pre-improvement, not post-improvement. So that is something that, um, you know, uh, we're watching very carefully on the building department side. I've already had uh, four projects that, um, you know, have run into the substantial improvement uh, wall with the new maps, uh, two of them have decided not to do it. I had a new home uh, in a flood zone. It wasn't in the historic district, but they, um, they, they withdrew their application because they didn't want to build it up, you know, the finished floor at 10 feet. Question, Peter. Yes. Uh, there is a structure on North Palmway in the historic district 300 block that they did take down to the uh, two by fours. I mean, it looks like a skeleton. Yep. Is that one of the subject properties? Is that fall into that category? They, they were at borderline um, substantial improvement. And we went around for almost two months before the permit was issued. And as soon as they took all the siding off the house um, and there were reasons why, but um, right. they crossed the threshold. And so now they're either going to have to get a historic exemption or they're going to need to raise the house up about a foot and a half. Wow. So, and, and I just want to say that, um, you know, in my discussions with Peter, you know, the Florida building code is the work area is 50% of the house, but the FEMA definition is 50% of the market value of the structure. Right. And, um, and so oftentimes it's the FEMA definition that catches folks. Now, Peter, we were talking about, um, you know, the market value. And a lot of times we would just go straight to the property appraiser for the market value of the structure, but people can get their own appraised value of their structure if they don't agree with the appraised value of the property appraiser as well. Well, uh, as we know, the property appraiser is not always the most accurate um, 
gauge a value, but that is the value. If no other data is provided, that is the value that I will use in order to, to determine if you're at a substantial improvement or, you know, or not. The um, other way to do it is you can have a licensed appraiser according to standard practices, give a value to the structure. And um, that is set forth in the FEMA Substantial Improvement Substantial Damage Desk Guide. And um, anybody who is going through this with me, I send them the link to the FEMA uh, document, which outlines what's to be included in the costs and what can be excluded from the cost, and also how to determine what the pre-improvement market value of the structure is. And, um, you know, we're audited every year um, by the CRS to make sure we are enforcing our flood regulations. Um, you know, three years ago, the uh, city was almost thrown out of the program. And we have come back into the good graces of uh, uh, FEMA through the work of my predecessors and the work we've done. And we've actually gotten down to, um, you know, in Florida, there are 400 communities in the state of Florida that are rated, um, you know, a seven. And there's about a little less than uh, uh, the, in the number six category. And then it drops way down. But there's a lot of uh, communities that are not as, uh, you know, are not getting the same discount because they're not being as vigilant in enforcing the codes. But again, it comes with a price. We have to have, you know, accuracy. We have to be enforcing our rules uniformly throughout. To get those know. discounts, for sure. And, and, and I'll just add to what Peter said is that in the CRAs, CRS, lower is better, right? So um, seven is better than an eight, a six is better than a seven. Um, so this is just the beginning part of our conversation, but because it's the most technical part, we're going to take a little break before we continue with Jordan. And we just wanted to um, see if you guys had any additional technical comments for Peter before we went on with the rest of the presentation. I'd like to add just one thing, Erin. Mm -hmm. um, the, if you know anybody who is currently going to be moving into the flood and having to get flood insurance, because if you have a, a federally backed mortgage, which 90% of the mortgages out there are federally backed, as soon as the maps get adopted, they will be getting a notice from their mortgage company saying, by the way, now you have to get flood insurance. And um, a lot of these homes, if they don't have flood insurance now, and they get a new policy, you know, after the maps come into effect, they're going to be BFE minus one, and it's going to be a huge, there's a big difference between base flood, base flood plus one, or base flood minus one. And if you're base flood minus one, um, if my memory serves me correct, it's like $3 per $100 of insured value. If you get your policy now, you're grandfathered in. And so the rate will gradually increase until you reach parity but at least you're not hit with that bill right away. So, um, you know, it, being in the historic district and, and, you know, being board members as you are, I would highly recommend to go to your peers and your neighbors and let them know, hey, this is coming. If you don't have flood insurance, you may need it. And if you get it now, yeah, you'll pay this year's premiums, but once the maps get adopted, your premium will not be the astronomical premium you'll gradually increase until you reach that parity. So, you know, grandfathering is a great thing in this and, case. And I will say that, you know, our most vulnerable structures probably are more of our mid-century structures and Jordan is gonna talk more about that, but we do have a lot of vernacular structures or older structures and some of those were naturally elevated. So they might be actually in a better position because they were not constructed at grade. So we'll, we'll have Jordan talk more about that. But um, so that's just kind of an interesting little twist, you know. Some of our original home construction might actually be more compliant with the flood requirements than our later construction. Right. <laughs> I have two quick questions. Go ahead. Is the, the first question is, uh, the Palm Beach County flood zone map, is that the same as the firm map at this point? The Palm Beach County flood maps are taken directly from FEMA. Um, so yes, they are the same. 
It's just right now um, they have the current map and then they list the pending map right. on and, their website. And so we, if you go to the pending elevation, that's what we will need to elevate to for projects that are substantial improvements or uh, new structures. Right. Okay. And then the, the second question was, did you just say that if, if someone were to buy the, the flood insurance right now, even though they didn't need it, yeah. they basically would not get bumped when the map is changed, when the map is adopted? The, the, my un current understanding of the flood insurance is if you're in an X zone or in, not in the flood zone at all and you get a preferred risk policy now, they can't raise the premiums to full market rate. They can only increase it. And I don't know what the exact figure is, but there's a figure they can only increase it 25% or whatever it is a year until you reach parity with what the levels, you know, the current level would be. So, you know, you may have a compliant now and, you know, uh, uh, for a base flood plus one, it's 71 cents per hundred. And, and I will say we're obviously not insurance brokers here, right? Yes, <laughs> so yes, the, those the, are approximate <laughs> numbers. So the best thing to do is, is check with your homeowner's insurance agent and they can provide you with um, more detail. But um, to your point, um, Palm Beach County does have a very quick and easy flood zone lookup, um, as Peter said, and they pulled the data from FEMA. And I'm gonna share it with you just if you could give me a, a quick moment um, here. So basically all you have to do is you just Google uh, PBC for Palm Beach County flood um, and um, it will, um, I'll show you the Google results. You'll, you'll see one of the Google results here will, will take you to flood zone map. It'll say maps.co Palm Beach County. And you can search in two ways. You can click up here um, in the left corner and just type in your address and it'll, and it'll pop up. Um, um, so you can just kind of see there was no, nothing there, but you know, you get the idea. Um, or you can just zoom and you just click and drag and you can just zoom right in. Um, and um, I think you have to get here to do the, you can see there it says current and then it says pending. The pending is the flood zone we have to use. So. And again, that's just, um, that's an easy way for you to take a quick look um, and uh, utilize that countywide resource. I have a question. I'm in a building that is definitely in the flood zone. However, the first habitable floor is well above the base flood elevation. Am I required to get flood insurance? If you have a federally backed mortgage, and you are in the special flood hazard area, it is a requirement that you have flood insurance. Um, if you do not have a mortgage, you are not required to have flood insurance or if it's a, pri or if it's a private mortgage. Thank you. If, um, I believe you, you spoke of, of uh, people buying insurance now. If you are already in a flood zone and you are already paying flood insurance, You'll continue to pay that. However, it will incrementally rise until it gets to the full amount, or when we renew, it'll go right up to the to the full amount. It, if as long as the policy is active, to the best of my knowledge, it will incrementally rise until you reach parity with the rates. I had another question. When these, um, when these start taking effect, we're going to be seeing properties that are being built at the higher floor, uh, finished floor level. And they're doing this by bringing in fill and things like that. Is, is, that, a going to, is that going to affect the water? Well, it's Chip, as usual, you're a little ahead of us. So um, we're, we're gonna go through all of that and what Peter and uh, Historic Preservation staff and I are all gonna work through is, is we need to eventually get there. Um, um, and then the, the idea though, is that when, when something is built that they can't dump their water on somebody else. I think that's what your, your point is, right? Sure, yeah, yeah. Maybe Peter, can you talk about the Florida building code and, and drainage and uh, just letting all the water go into your neighbor because you're higher? Oh, one question, what is, any idea of the time frame on this? 
Well, it's effective now. So now. As far <laughs> as the, the adoption of the maps, Palm Beach County has put in a uh, challenge to the data. Um, you know, the latest I've heard is, you know, maybe summer, but okay. um, they will uh, uh, give us a 90 day advance notice once they publish the maps officially. And, um, you know, from there, you'll have 90 days um, to go out and notify the communities. But the last I heard um, was they're hoping to get it uh, early this summer. Um, but again, the maps, the last map, it was two and a half years from the time they rolled it out until the time it was adopted. So it just depends on, you know, how fast government works. And, and so here, here's what happened though. So I just want to explain that Peter, I think the, the last, the, the first, like the, the maps we used for years and years and years were really from the seventies. Yes. And, and then FEMA basically did a restudy of the area and those maps were rolled out in 2017 and adopted in 2018 or were they adopted in 2017? They were rolled out in 2016. Um, no, I, I think 2015 and they didn't get adopted either 2014 or 2015 and they didn't get adopted until October of 16. Mm -hmm. So basically we had the 70s until like 2015. So what happened is, is that they were already starting to work on this what, as Peter mentioned, all of this wave action data. And it's just unfortunate that that timing didn't align with all of that new data. And Peter, I know we talked before, you brought up why the challenge with the data, what, and, you know, what was the reasoning they're challenging the data. I think that's important for them to understand because it's not necessarily, uh, we don't know how successful they're going to be in that challenge because of what they're challenging. So Palm Beach County's challenge is based upon the um, LIDAR. They flew airplanes over and they got uh, ground uh, penetrating radar and they got ground elevations from the LIDAR data. The current FEMA maps are based on, I believe, uh, early 2000 LIDAR data. And Palm Beach County, when they brought out the maps in 2014, Palm Beach County did a LIDAR um, uh, overfly of the entire county and their challenge is based on they have better data available you know with the latest and greatest um you know aerial elevations um my position because i was at the meeting is look uh, lake worth beach hasn't changed drastically um as far as any elevations within the city limits so i don't believe that uh, you know, a challenge on our part would be productive because not much has changed in the past 10 years or 15 years, even, you know, here within the city boundaries of Lake Worth Beach. We don't there have a big a inlet. We don't have, right. We're not like Boynton where we have a big inlet or we don't have some of those other things. So, um, or mass yeah. developments where they've changed the topography of the, the land and added drainage like they have out West. So, um, I ask something because um, uh, Peter, you talked before about what the current rates are per, I think you said 100 per uh, was 70 cents per hundred dollars of, of value. That's correct. Value. And that's that's the that is the proposed amount, or depending on which flood zone you're in, or what do we is what does that compare to what they're charging now? And that's so, saying, the numbers that I'm throwing out were numbers that I got from 2012 um, when I was at an insurance meeting. So the, the numbers are, you know, uh, nine years old. Um, but, you know, it ranged, um, you know, BFE plus two was 41 cents per hundred. BFE plus one was 7,700, 70, 71 cents per hundred dollars. Base flood was $1.77 for hundred dollars of insured value. So it's all based upon uh, when you apply for flood insurance, you have an elevation certificate that states your finished floor elevation, the lowest adjacent grade to the property. And it also gives you the flood zone. Just to put so, it perspective, you know, if you have a elevation certificate that has all the data, and then you would just need to go to an insurance agent to find out what the rates would be. 
to put it into perspective, I just did a quick calculation and said that if my structure is insurable at 75,000, um, I'd be looking at, at a 70 cents per hundred dollars of value. I'd be looking at $5,200 a year from just blood. If your numbers are correct, I didn't check the math, but it could be. <laughs> and, and you had another, you had a dollar on that. Wow. Well, it's not that high. Question, uh, Peter. Um, this information, is it going to be something that the city has or the city will maybe put in like the uh, little utility bill newspaper or something to where the public is uh, aware of what's going to happen? Um, I am right now. Uh, I just finished a two-day class on the CRS and the changes that were made to the CRS program. Um, I'm going to be reaching out to management to see if we can do a direct mailing to all utility customers, just letting them know, hey, new maps are coming and um, they will have my contact information. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm more than happy to disseminate uh, uh, information. And um, the more we do community outreach, the more points we get and the better our insurance scores will be and the more discount we can obtain for the residents. Because I mean, if the, if the information goes out, you know, the, the majority of our community is very social media minded. It, it spreads very quickly, the news, and also the post will pick it up, the coastal, will, you know, Mark's paper will pick it up. I just think making everybody aware because it just stops the phone calls to all of us really. Sure, and this is, you know, because you're the Historic Preservation Board, um, we, we did a presentation, um, William and Peter did a presentation to the commission um, in November. Um, we wanted to roll this out to our advisory boards and then we're gonna come up with a strategic outreach plan um, to roll this out to the community. But you guys are our advisory boards and, and um, our boards are gonna hear this first, you know, obviously. And we, there's also a technical, we haven't even gotten to the second half of the presentation, so we should probably get there um, because we have a, a more to tell you about this um, with related and relation to your specific role. So if you guys are ready, um, this, is, this is the beginning of the conversation that we're gonna have with the community and with you. So this is the first opener. So I'm gonna go ahead and reshare and um, we can definitely get back to uh, Peter's not, Peter is not running away. So you don't have to worry about him evacuating, you know, <laughs> and we're going to go ahead and talk about um, historic designation and, and some of the benefits of historic designation. Um, and, I, and before we get started, um, I just want to mention my, my parents live, um, they live on a river in um, Western Florida and it's a tidal river and they have a home, uh, you know, um, about a little under 1700 square feet. And uh, they recently purchased flood insurance with no discount um, and with no base flood elevation and they paid about $2,600 for it. So, so $2,600. So what we're, we're not talking about necessarily five or 10 or 15, you have to look at your individual structure and talk to your insurance agent. So just definitely, if you're concerned, Look at your look at the flood map, and then go and then talk to your insurance agent. Okay, so uh, this is uh, Jordan Hodges, um, Senior Preservation Coordinator. For the record, and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the historic districts and and what this kind of all means for us. Uh, but just a little recap: uh, Lake Worth Beach currently has six historic districts covering about 2,700 parcels. Uh, and a significant amount of those parcels are located in flood zones. Um, and structures within historic districts, as you know, are evaluated utilizing criteria established by the National Park Service uh, to determine whether um, a structure can be designated as historic. And the structures that meet these criteria can be designated as contributing resources to a historic district. Uh, and these buildings utilize our local protections established through our historic preservation ordinance to prevent um, adverse alterations, which could affect the historic significance of a building. Uh, but there are also buildings that are not currently considered historic, but that are located within our district boundaries. 
and these are our non-contributing resources. Um, but one of the most common reasons why the buildings in our historic districts are considered non-contributing is because they did not meet the minimum 50-year age requirement uh, to be considered eligible for a historic designation at the time our districts were created. Um, so our historic districts um, were established in the 1990s and early 2000s, which was over 20 years ago. So a lot of our mid-century buildings uh, that are located in flood zones are not currently designated uh, because they were not, or because when they were surveyed, they were only 35 or 40 years old. Um, now that's important because the only exemption in the Florida Building Code to allow for substantial improvements or additions to properties that do not comply with base flood elevation requirements are designated historic structures. Uh, now from 2015 to 2020, our city was awarded around 200,000 uh, in grant monies through the Florida Division of Historic Resources to resurvey our historic districts. And the result of that, you know, that kind of showed that the majority of our structures that are currently designated as non-contributing buildings are eligible for reclassification as contributing structures with the adoption of our new surveys. Uh, we don't, or we do currently have an administrative process in place to allow non-contributing resources uh, to become contributing if the surveys support it and the homeowner volunteers for a status change. Um, but if your property is located outside of a historic district and potentially meets the designation criteria in our historic preservation ordinance, um, your property can be evaluated for an individual designation. Uh, and this is when a property owner voluntarily applies for uh, the designation as a historic structure. And the designation would be reviewed by staff, uh, reviewed by you all, and then uh, sent to city commission. Um, but uh, becoming a designated historic structure or a contributing building, um, again, those are protected by local ordinance and uh, they require the review of any exterior alterations to a property for compliance with the regulations in our preservation ordinance and our design guidelines. Um, so once a property becomes a contributing resource or becomes an individually designated property, there is no mechanism available to voluntarily remove that designation. Um, so what that kind of means is, you know, if somebody wanted to apply to be a contributing structure to do their addition and get out of raising it or get out of raising their entire property, um, they can't just automatically uh, remove that historic designation after the work is completed. Okay, so uh, as we were saying earlier, the Florida Building Code allows for a variance uh, from base flood elevation requirements for designated historic buildings. And this is because the, the strict interpretation of the Florida Building Code may result in alterations to a building, which cause it to lose its uh, historic character or change it in such a way that the building would be unrecognizable from its original appearance, uh, which could result in a de-designation. Um, so, Think of a, a low mid-century modern ranch uh, that is designated as historic, but that you know, might need to be elevated by four or five feet. Um, so it would dramatically change the massing and design characteristics of that architecture. Uh, but if you look at the exemption text in red, uh, it states that our historic preservation program has to still recognize the property as historic once the work performed under the variance is completed. And that's determined through design review uh, by the historic board and the certificate of appropriateness process. Uh, and below show the considerations for a historic building. And since the city operates a municipal historic preservation program, and since we designated the resources to begin with, um, we would fall under category three. Um, the city's land development regulations also provide, a ver or, you know, provide for variances of flood resistant construction. Um, this is again reviewed by the HRPB in tandem, um, but it adds uh, the criteria that the variance must be the minimum necessary to preserve the historic character and design of the uh, resource. So I'll show you a couple of examples. Um, and before we go on, Jordan, I just want to say in your in really why we're here presenting to you and, and why we're starting this conversation now um, with you is that there might be changes down the road with results with maybe design guidelines or other, other regulatory outcomes because um, to address you know, elevation and other things. So this is why 
we're bringing it to you in your role as a historic preservation board. Um, so this was a substantial improvement example or an addition example at uh, 1020 South Lakeside Drive. I'm sure some of you all remember this project. Um, but this was a case where the building, um, again, is a mid-century ranch, which are typically characterized as being single-story, low-lying horizontal buildings. Uh, now, on the top image, you can see a rear flat roof addition that was made to the building, I think, sometime in the 70s. Uh, but the homeowners wanted to remove that and undergo a complete interior and exterior renovation um, and add mo a more substantial rear addition that was in keeping with the architectural character of the house. Um, and this plan could have tripped the substantial improvement threshold. So the entire building in addition could have had to be raised uh, several or a couple feet to comply with the new maps. Um, and which would have been very expensive um, and would have permanently altered the massing and design of the building. Um, the building is, or, you know, is in the South Palm Park District and it had a non-contributing designation status. Uh, so it was not eligible for the exemption. Uh, but the new surveys listed the building as eligible for a contributing status. So the homeowners requested a redesignation. Um, and with this, they were able to come before the HRPB. And you all found that the variance uh, to maintain that the bill or that the variance um, was required to maintain the building's contributing status. Okay, uh, another one um, in this property, or in this case, the property owner was planning um, a small two-story addition that you see in the proposed front perspective drawing. Um, and current base flood standards would have placed the floor um, of the addition um, much higher than the floor of the existing structure. And again, in this case, you all reviewed the application and determined that the variance to allow the addition to stay at the structure's existing floor height uh, was necessary um, as the addition constructed, uh, you know, significantly higher would have adversely affected the architectural integrity of the building and would potentially preclude it from maintaining a contributing status. Um, you know, Jordan, I just was thinking of a segue to tie back to Peter. Peter, are you on right now? Can you answer a quick question for me? Because I think I know the answer, but I'd want to confirm it with the floodplain administrator before I say it. So, He might have stepped away from his computer. So when we come back, um, we'll remind uh, Peter to loop back because I believe the only areas that have a base flood elevation requirement are in the 100-year floodplain, not in the 500-year floodplain. So I think that that's important to note, and we'll just triple confirm that with Peter when he gets back. So the area impacted area for these base flood elevation variances may not be as big as maybe you perceived. Peter, are you on? It is just the 100 year floodplain where you have to elevate to the base flood elevation. The yeah. 500 year is not a requirement, but it is a recommendation. Right, so really these variances are where it is required. So these would only be within the 100 year floodplain. Um, but some owner or some homeowners um, may also elect to voluntarily elevate their buildings. Um, and this will be a process that will be reviewed by the HRPB. And some architectural styles and construction methods are gonna be more easily elevated than others. Um, so it's going to be, you know, homeowners are gonna elect to raise some of their buildings uh, due to the in insurance savings and just the safety of mind that, they're, that their buildings are elevated and, you know, somewhat out of danger. Um, but contributing buildings will have, or, you know, people who own contributing buildings um, will have the variance um, option moving forward. Um, so it, it does give people a little bit of flexibility in determining what they wanna do. Um, in either of those cases, where they're choosing to apply for a variance or whether they're choosing to raise their building, um, those are going to be put before you all for review. Thank you, Jordan. So um, <clears throat> I'm just going to go ahead and, and wrap up and, and kind of dovetail this into the concepts of sustainability and resilience. Um, you know, as you know, we're, we're called the Department of Community Sustainability. Sustainability is a big component of our comp plan and our LDRs. Um, and, you know, a sustainable community looks at a healthy local environment. You look at quality of life. You look at economic vitality, uh, where resilience 
is the ability of that same sustainable community to adapt to changing conditions over time. And this includes obviously flood risk for coastal communities and sea level rise. So we, in our current comprehensive plan, we address both community sustainability and resilience. You can see I pull out some objectives from our coastal management element and our future land use um, uh, element. And then <clears throat> again, then in broadening this back out, um, the city participates in the Southeast Florida Climate Compact, which has regional sea level rise projections. Um, there's a great case study on the business case for resilience and hardening. Um, that um, I have provided the link and we can send that out to you. Um, we are also involved with a coastal resilience partnership. And this is an ongoing uh, assessment and it's due to be completed um, by the end of the year. And it's a uh, multi-jurisdictional um, effort of about seven or eight cities in central Palm Beach County um, <clears throat> to really um, assess climate change vulnerability, including increasing, potentially increasing flood risk. Um, and, and I will just put this into perspective, you know, really with regards to elevation and sea level rise, you know, we're not in that same bucket as Miami-Dade County. You know, we are higher and we do have more time to look at these issues and continue to adapt and address. So really just the beginning of this conversation, and this is, as you can see, this is going to be a much longer conversation um, between staff and you and the city and the commission, all of us kind of moving forward together um, to look at not only the current flood zone impacts, but to look at sea level rise, to look at resilience and to have those conversations. Um, also, um, a lot of South Florida communities have really been leading the way. So um, you look at Miami Beach, you look at a lot of communities in Monroe County that have been very low for a very long time, St. Augustine, and they have, you know, they have graciously volunteered to experiment and we can look at their, what they've done and what's worked and what hasn't worked um, as we move forward. Staff is gonna be evaluating grant opportunities. We're gonna be looking at that new data from the vulnerability assessment from the Coastal Resilience Partnership. And we're gonna be looking at examples from other South Florida communities to inform future changes to, con to code and design guidelines. And once again, this is just the beginning of the conversation. I just wanted to also just throw in there because of you all or your board and who you are and you have so many design professionals, um, just a, a really interesting um, thing that uh, Miami Beach did is they did um, a re resiliency and adaptation guidelines. Um, <clears throat> and uh, they talked about, uh, you know, structure types and the different types of hardening and uh, flood uh, flood mitigation um, by type building typology. So that if you're, if you want to nerd out on this and you want to have some fun, that might be a fun thing to pick up. So um, basically that concludes our presentation, not to end on a, on a down note, but um, uh, we just wanted to kind of let you know what's happening. Obviously you heard Peter's going to be moving forward with the manager and with William to develop kind of a rollout um, over the spring uh, to our residents about the immediate impact. But we also wanted to let you know, we're thinking, we're, we're looking at the bigger picture and we're gonna we'll be looking at um, potential uh, funding and uh, for regulatory or, um, you know, modifications of our LDRs or guidelines or different things and looking at um, best practices. So we'll continue to bring some of these issues back to you. Aaron and Peter both, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent uh, information. We, we appreciate that. I suppose that's a segue into uh, new business item B. Yes, sir, it is. I will um, end my presentation. So, um, Jordan, are you up or is this Abe again? Uh, Abe's going to be doing this item. Can I watch this somewhere? Is there a TV? All right, good evening. So 
Right now, we'll be moving on to item B, which is a certificate of appropriateness for the conversion of an existing plus or minus 404 square foot garage into additional living space for the single family residents, a historic waiver for the minimum required rear setback and a variance from base flood elevation requirements of the Florida Building Code for the property located at 130 North Ocean Breeze. So again, to recap with this request, uh, it requires three approvals, certificate of appropriateness for exterior alterations to the existing garage, a variance from base flood elevation requirements, and a historic waiver from the minimum required rear setback. The subject property is a 50 by 135 platted lot of record located on the southeast corner of North Ocean Breeze and 2nd Avenue North in Lakewood Beach. The subject property is located within the multifamily MF20 zoning district and retains a future land use of downtown mixed use. For the documentation within the city's property files, the single family uh, structure at 130 North Ocean Breeze was constructed in a wood frame vernacular architectural style circa 1925. The property appraiser cards from 1943 and 1956 indicate the structure was designed with a concrete pure foundation, wood lap siding exterior walls, a gable roof and wood windows and doors. A detached mission revival Rear garage fronting 2nd Avenue North was also constructed in the early 1920s, as you can see in this property card. And according to the property card, the garage was designed to accommodate two vehicles, featured a concrete slab foundation, stucco exterior walls, a flat roof, and wood garage doors. City permits indicate the primary structure had alterations over time, including roof replacement, a rear screen room addition in 1982, window replacement, shutter and awning installation, electrical upgrades, and a new driveway ad adjacent to the garage. On this slide, we can see several images of the existing garage and the primary residence on the corner. This is a current um, property survey illustrating the location and footprints of the two historic structures, the main residence and the garage. As you can see, um, the existing garage is very close to that rear setback. The project proposes to install a repurposed uh, pair of French doors and a single hung window that will be protected by wood storm shutters. The proposed um, garage will maintain the uh, garage doors fronting 2nd Avenue North, so there will no, the only exterior alterations are proposed on the south elevation. As visible from the street, there will not be any changes. Site improvements include a new walkway and ramp connecting the converted garage to the single family residence. The existing uh, driveway on the west side of the garage, as you can see on the side plan, will replace the two parking spaces um, that will be taking up uh, inside the garage for additional living space. As I mentioned, uh, the conversion will maintain the garage doors. As you can see in the floor plan, one of those bays will have a wall behind it. Uh, for a closet. The second bay will be closed off for additional storage. And this floor plan also includes a new bathroom. Moving on to the zoning analysis, as outlined in the site data table, the existing garage is in conflict with the minimum required five foot rear setback as indicated in the city's land development regulations. The applicant has requested relief from this code section um, by applying for a historic waiver. And in the following slides, I'll explain why a historic waiver uh, was required for a structure that was constructed that way and nothing is changing. In addition, because the um, garage is going from non-habitable space to habitable space, that will trigger um, the base flood elevation requirements for the finished floor. The requirement is eight feet for the zone AE plus 12 inches of freeboarding, which brings the total to nine. And the applicant is proposing a base flood of 7.9, which is 
1.1 feet below that requirement, so a variance uh, was applied for that. So moving on to the variance analysis, as I just explained, um, the existing garage is at 7.5. The applicant is proposing a new topping slab to level the existing floor, except for the area for storage. That would bring it to 7.9. As I just mentioned, the requirement is nine feet. So the variance is for that 1.1 foot deficiency. In the previous uh, presentation by Jordan, he explained that um, the Florida Building Code does provide an exception for contributing structures um, in a historic district and individually listed structures and um, our LDRs uh, provide that the process to get to that uh, Florida Building Code exception is to request um, a variance from the Historic Preservation Board. And it is staff's analysis uh, that the contributing, since this is a contributing resource, the Old Lucerne Local Historic District, the property is eligible for this exception and the proposed changes would not preclude its continuation um, as a contributing resource to this district. So moving on to grant a variance, there is specific criteria, A, B, and C. In pages six and seven of the staff report, we provided a response to this criteria. The applicant also provided uh, responses included as attachment E of the board packet. I'll just quickly uh, read that criteria A's failure to grant the variance would result in exceptional hardship due to the physical characteristics of the land that render the lot undevelopable, increased cost to satisfy the requirements or inconvenience do not constitute hardship. The granting of a variance will not result in increased flood heights, additional threats to public safety, extraordinary public expense, nor great nuisances cause fraud on or victimization of the public or conflict with existing laws and ordinances, and the variance is the minimum necessary considering the flood hazard to afford relief. So it is staff's analysis that complying with the strict interpretation of the Florida Building Code would cause a disruption in the structure's historic appearance. Raising the finished floor elevation of the garage an additional 1.1 feet would likely require the structure to be elevated or the existing roof line to be raised. As proposed, the conversion will maintain the garage appearance by preserving the garage doors fronting 2nd Avenue North. And alternatively, if the structure was raised, that would alter the historic height and massing proportions that characterize this mission revival structure. So moving on to our historic preservation analysis, all exterior alterations within a historic district must comply with visual compatibility criteria. Staff has provided a response to that criteria under section 23.5-4, King 1 and 2 on pages 7 to 10 of the staff report, and we've made positive findings for that criteria. Our historic preservation analysis also involves uh, reviewing compliance with our historic preservation design guidelines. As we're familiar, the design guidelines have an overview of our different historic districts and chapter five provides an overview of the 10 primary architectural styles in our historic districts. Uh, under chapter five, we have mission revival, which as I mentioned earlier in the presentation is what we're uh, classifying uh, the existing garage. The project proposes to install, as I mentioned, those French doors and new window on the south um, elevation as outlined in our um, historic preservation design guidelines. A one over one hung window and glazed doors with decorative light patterns are common and compatible in the city's mission revival structures. Chapter four of the design guidelines also discusses character defining features such as shuttering systems and the proposed wood storm shutters are compatible for the garage's uh, 1920s period of construction. So moving on to the discussion of the historic waiver, here is just a close up uh, of the garage. As you can see, um, the minimum five foot um, setback is illustrated. 
and as constructed, the structure has a legal non-conforming setback of three feet, seven inches. So uh, under LDR section 23.5-3D, uh, it discusses non-conforming buildings. And as noted in criteria three, deterioration or destruction of a non-conforming structure beyond 33% of its assessed value requires compliance with the current LDR requirements. And according to the project architect, the conversion and, and all the improvements that are proposed would likely exceed that threshold. Um, so again, um, the idea is if you pass a certain threshold with your non-conformity, you would need to conform unto our LDRs. Um, but our code also keeps in mind our historic structures and that's why we have the waiver process available. So we're not hindering rehabilitation of historic structures. That's a good segue to LDR section 23.5-4R, which lists out incentives uh, for improvements to contributing structures. And that's where it mentions that the board can modify certain land development regulations and that includes setbacks. Under LDR section 23.5-4R2, um, there's criteria for granting a waiver. Staff has provided a response to, to that criteria in page 12 of the staff report. And the applicant has also provided responses to that criteria as attachment H of the board packet. And it is staff's analysis that due to the historic nature of the parcels development over time, the existing garage currently encroaches on the rear setback. Inconsistencies with current setback requirements are common in the surrounding districts due to different development standards and practices and practices in place over the course of the city's development. The proposed conversion will not further the deficiency as it will take place within the existing footprint of the garage. So in conclusion, uh, the majority of the improvements are not vis visible from the street. They are, however, still historically compatible with the mission revival um, architectural style and adheres to the recommendations provided in the city's historic preservation design guidelines. Staff recommends uh, approval with conditions for the certificate of appropriateness for exterior alteration and also recommends approval for the variance from base flood elevation requirements and the historic waiver as the contributing structure meets the eligibility uh, requirements for, the, for that relief. So that concludes staff's presentation. Um, I can go over some of the conditions of approval or we can hand it over to the project architect. Okay, uh, are there any uh, board questions for the project architect? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, Bob. Thank you, Jude. Um, the door and window, that's on the, in the photo that we were just looking at, um, Abraham, with the photo of the garage. Yeah, that's on which wall, it's on the uh, bottom right, it's on that wall? So it's on this wall. Um, so the street is on this side. Uh, so, right. here we, so here we can see, um, it looks like two openings that were, you know, enclosed over time. And it's on this side that the new French door and the new single hung window are proposed. Yeah, so it's, that, can, it's that top left picture, Bob, the south elevation. Right. So the top, top left picture. So, okay, so it's on the back of the garage is where the door would be. Okay, I'm, I was just a little confused on that. Oh. And if, if you could just um, go to the property card file. All right, uh, if memory serves me right, that's a one bedroom house, isn't it? The front structure? Um, I believe Mr. Harris. Yeah. I, I, I believe that is a one bedroom. I'm just making reference out of memory. Uh, I wanted to see the property card because that is a small home. All right, thank you. Other questions from staff, from uh, board members? I'm a little confused on those French doors. They are on the south side or they are replacing the existing garage doors? No, um, so garage. yeah, so I'll just quickly recap. So um, this is what you see from the street on 2nd Avenue North. 
So this view will virtually not change. Here on the right, there's gonna be a wall built behind it and there's gonna be a closet. On the left side, um, it will still operate um, as a garage door because they will be using Abe, that paper. Abe, Abe, we're not seeing your pointer. So we're seeing- Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, can you, can you use your pointer? Oh, I think it's on the wrong screen. I'm sorry, just a second. I was really pantomime here in the room. <laughs> and I was getting confused. It had a Vanna White moment. You oh, know? Okay, sorry. <laughs> there you go. I have three, three screens, sorry. <laughs> okay, so sorry. So this is what you see from the street uh, on the right. Um, okay. so they will be building, like I said, a wall behind it. There's going to be a closet okay. on the left bay. They will be using for storage. So in that sense, that garage door will still open and close. Where they're proposing their changes is on the opposite side. So the very back of the garage, that's where you're gonna get a, a new uh, pair of French doors and a new window. Okay, my question on those French doors, the shutters on the sides, do they close like clam, clam shells? Are they hurricane shutters? I mean, they just look funny. I think they are on those. On those yeah. yeah. Hurricane impact they, rated. So, uh, so they flip so, over and close. I think they roll. Well, whatever. They close over the front. Yeah, door. so you, you can kind of see they, they would roll in, and I think this smaller one would just flip over. Um, and I believe these would be custom engineered wood oh, uh, working shops. Yeah. I mean, it truly is a minimal, minimal change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it does say non impact rated white aluminum. So maybe uh, Jeffrey can speak to that. <laughs> Uh, Jeffrey, that, uh, um, that's that's for the window. Yeah, he'll be able to speak from that. From what I understood, the door and the window were repurposed, and I believe they're both non-impact, and that's why that uh, new uh, door. Are the windows impact? Well. Maybe that's why the shuttering system is not. I think no, no. It's the other way around. I think the the window and the doors are not, but we can leave that to the to the architect. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Harris uh, in the next room. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you can come over here and answer these questions on the okay. list. There was a question as to whether the French doors are impact. The French doors are not impact. The, the French doors and the window are non-rated units. However, the, the shutter system is going to be engineered to be impact rated. We'll have the correct hardware on it. We're just going to have an engineer do that. Okay, thank you. Other questions from board members? Is there any public comment on this project? Can, um, Mr. Chairman, can you ask Mr. Harris if he can, if the um, microphone is live where the public, member of the public are supposed to speak in front of the dais, perhaps he can go check that. Alfonso, can you please check? I hate to do administrative items, but that's something we probably should have arranged prior to. I apologize. Also, is the homeowner here? Is the homeowner here, uh, Mr. Harris? I'm not sure. She's that would uh, be R Rolanda? Yes. yes. Can you check? She's her? over as an attendee. Yeah, if we could. Yeah, can we bring her over? I just promoted her. She'll, she's okay. a Can you hear me now? Good evening, everyone. It's the first time I see you. Yes. <laughs> I just hear your voice. Yes, we've spoken many, many times. Miss <laughs> um, Epstein, could you please state your name for the record? Yes, my name, address? yes my name is Rolanda Epstein. That's Rolanda with an R. Epstein, E-P-S-T-E-I-N. And I'm at 130 North Ocean Breeze. And that's Lake Worth Beach, Florida, 33460. Okay, now next question is, do we have any public comment on this from anyone? Perhaps Ms. Cole? No, we have not received any public comment on this um, project. Okay. The way I understand it, the potential motion uh, encompasses all three issues. Is that correct? That is correct. So are there any other 
questions uh, or discussion amongst the board? Yeah, I have a couple of questions. I was wondering, is there a difference in the rear setback for a garage structure um, as opposed to a living structure? There, there is. Um, so um, when, when I started working with Rolanda, she actually initially submitted a zoning verification uh, she was initially interested in an ADU, and we identified a few hurdles um, for that. Uh, one of them is an increased setback requirement. Um, so with, with, um, with the conversion of it uh, as habitable space, but not an ADU, it would still be in the same setback requirement for an accessory building, not the additional requirement for an accessory dwelling unit. Um, really where the waiver came into play is kind of passing a threshold of improvements of your nonconformity where you have to adhere to our LDRs. So what is the setback for a ADU? I will pull that up. So, um, is that, is that a, I didn't think we had ADUs. But... It's a multifamily. It's in multifamily, yeah. Um, Abe, I think the additional, if this is in the single family district, I believe in that zoning letter, one of the additional things we identified was that they weren't permitted. No, <laughs> so, um, this is in so multifamily. This, this, is, this is in the two family because it's close to downtown. It's in an MF20. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's what it was. I, we, we, we do a lot of letters, so <laughs> I couldn't remember which letter. So Chip, um, the, the rear setback increases to 10. But for a garage, it's five, correct? Correct. Yeah. So Question. Then, Go ahead. Garage, sorry, Bill. Sorry, Bill. Excuse me. For, uh, for, for as a garage, it's non-conforming by 1.1 1. 1 foot. Uh, I think it's uh, one foot. Um, it's a little bit more than that. Um, for five five inches, inches or something. But uh, anyway. But for a dwelling, it'd be uh, off by about seven feet. Yes, a, li a little under that. And the, the other thing that kind of stuck out to me is it's, it's not as, um, the, two, the two different structures are, have, have quite a different mm -hmm. um, architectural style, the, the front house and the, and the garage. Um, front house is, is just a frame vernacular, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we, we actually see that quite a bit um, throughout the city. Uh, for whatever reason, in the 20s, um, Mission Revival was a very popular um, style, um, probably because it was, it was inexpensive to build. You know, there's not a lot of ornament to it. It's just frame and stucco. Um, but we see those uh, quite a bit throughout the city as detached rear sheds or garage or even garage yeah. apartments. That's a great point. Uh, I for some reason, Mission, when they were going with a different style, the ones that we see most in the city is they go to Mission. Yeah. Question. Yes, Mr. Dorenzo, go ahead. All right. So, since you're basically doing this as a garage and a living quarters of an extension of the front dwelling and not an AD, whatever, um, this is basically just extended living space to the front dwelling, correct? That's where we're going with yes. this? Yes. Okay, so that would basically create a, uh, if they were to rent it out, it would be a roommate situation, one electric meter, one water meter for the property, that type of thing. Yes, they're not going for the full conversion to the ADU, so it doesn't have a full kitchen. It would not get a separate meter. Um, and the only reason, not, yeah, the only reason I'm saying that, we, we did not see any of the terminology that you put on the uh, property on uh, North Ocean Breeze, the one prior, as far as uh, rental restrictions and all of that. So hey, basically, did it's, one, I'm sorry, did this one even meet the square footage requirement for an ADU? So um, the minimum uh, living area is 400 square feet, I believe. Yeah. So there, there would be a... a it would be 400 square feet. When with that storage room, the actual livable space is considerably less than 400 square feet. Correct. 
So this would not, never be an ADU. This is the garage. As Mr. Well, Dorenzo says, it's an it's a additional living space for the house. Yes. Oh, guest, guest quarters. Guest quarters. Guest quarters. Um, if that person decides so, to have roommate in quotes, they can do that. I'm just playing devil's advocate over here. I just want to say that this is different than the, than your previous case because ADUs are permitted. This isn't a multifamily district. Correct. No, yes. I understand um, That's why I was asking that question. Um, yeah. How we typically craft those conditions are based on the SFR zoning. Um, so this is multifamily. So if in the future they wanted to explore that and they wanted, you know, a different relief again for the rear setback, they could look at that. But um, the ADU use is, is allowed, just they're not converting the space to meet uh, those requirements. All right, so what happens down the road, and I'm just talking, they want to add more square footage to that rear structure and stay with the mission style and all of that. What we're voting on right now, as far as the setbacks and all of that, would that stay in place? Or then you're going to get into the elevations and all of that, say so, two, three years down the road. Um, kind of how our conditions are crafted for the variance and for the waiver is that it's project specific. Specific. Okay. So, um, you know, if you're an ADU, like we said, um, you know, you have your minimum area, you have to park for it. Um, you know, you, we can't carry over. This is being, these reliefs are being granted for the project as presented before you. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other uh, thoughts or can I hear a motion? I move to approve. Uh, move to approve HRPB project number 21001004, and 21-016-0001 with staff recommended conditions for a certificate of appropriateness for the conversion of the ex existing plus or minus 404 garage into additional living space for the single family residents, historic waiver for the minimum required rear setback and a variance from the base flood elevation requirement of the Florida building code for the property located at 130 North Ocean Breeze based on the competent substantial evidence in the staff report and pursuant to the city of Lake Worth Beach land development regulations and historic preservation requirements. Thank you. Can I hear a second? A second. Seconded by Ms. Fox. Any additional discussion or let's move all, all in favor say aye. 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 Uh, opposed nay. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good night, all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Now on to item C, which is 807 North Ocean Breeze, a conceptual <laughs> review. Hey, guys. Again, this is, uh, for the record, this is Jordan Hodges, Senior Preservation Coordinator, and um, we're going to be doing the conceptual review for this property. Uh, this property is actually owned by our very own Miss Erin Sita. Um, she's planning an addition to her house and she'd like to get some feedback. So we're going to kind of explain the conditions and a rough idea of, of where she's going with this. And um, so you say, can... Before we go any further, Jordan, I just want to say part of why we're here so early in the process is because obviously Abe and Jordan report to me. So I have been working with William to get guidance and input on this. And we just in an abundance of caution to be very um, ethical. And we wanted to bring this to you all for feedback. Um, and we're, we were working with Pam and uh, we're gonna continue to shift that over to Susan to work out a plan where um, the review will not be conducted uh, principally by Abe and Jordan. They may have all, help out with, and then the recommendation, there'll be a, basically um, it, it'll be handled in a very professional, appropriate way um, if I go forward with it. So, okay. but that's kind of why we're here tonight. <laughs> go ahead, Jordan. Okay, let's sure. Uh, so um, on the left, um, on the map, you can see her parcel outlined in red. Um, it's kind of one of those small early structures that were situated to the very rear of the lot. 
Um, you can see over on the right hand column, the current setbacks, um, the rear setback is at five feet and the front is at 84 feet. So the only real space that, um, you know, she has to work with is in the front of the structure. Uh, this is a photograph um, as it sits today, again, at the back of the lot. Uh, the building has kind of minimal detailing. Uh, it's a frame structure with a stucco facade. It has a forward-facing uh, gable roof and a lean-to addition to the south. There's a couple more photographs. You can see my son's soccer net in the front yard. <laughs> Um, and this is just a little bit of um, history of the property. Uh, we dug around in the property file a little bit. Um, it looks like there was a kind of a port cashier addition to the rear of the property, um, an open car garage uh, built in 1941. And that was con converted into living space uh, in 2005. Um, also here, you can see that there is a, a, a lean-to addition that was likely put in sometime in the 30s, um, which is kind of runs the, the length of the south of the house there. Um, and then on the front of the building, um, that enclosed porch that you see um, on the bottom left photograph, um, that, well, that, that is an enclosed porch. Uh, the property file from the 40s lists it as screen and glass. Um, and there's um, some question as to whether those walls were constructed appropriately. Um, I know Aaron's had some kind of structural issues in that area. Um, but this is kind of a, a rough idea of a, of a kind of floor plan that they're working with. Um, you can see here on the arrow, there's, that's where the front of the house is. Um, it's currently labeled as the office. Um, that is that, um, that enclosed porch. Uh, but they would be adding a family room, dining room, kitchen, and a half bath, and then reconfiguring the existing floor plan of the existing structure just to kind of make it uh, function a little bit better. Um, so I will just say that when we looked at the floor plan, when we thought about the addition and, and how we were going to attach to the house and make it function as a, as a single family home, um, one of the reasons why we decided to attach in the area which is labeled as office is because um, that area is not, um, was never historically designed to look like that, one, and two, could probably use some, could probably be reconstructed so it doesn't fall down one day. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> I have actually tiled over in the front room and um, it's, it's actually doesn't have a um, foundation there. It's just like basically kind of pavers. <laughs> and within my house and the area between the office and the living room, I still have the original door frame and window frames, which I'm planning on retaining because it adds a lot of character and charm in the house. And it has the original exterior frames. <clears throat> um, but the, uh, the project architect has kind of uh, put together some different facade options. Um, and this would be the front facade. Um, some of them have a gable roof, some have a hip roof. Um, there are different window configurations, different porch column configurations. Um, a couple or the ones with the, um, with the hip roof have a little dormer feature with a vent. Um, and then the, the door placement um, kind of varies. So I know that Aaron kind of wanted to, to get feedback on that, but I'll flip through the rest of the slides and then we can come back to, to detailing. Um, so this would be the, uh, the side elevation. As you can see, that little hyphen there in the middle, um, that is that um, projecting enclosed porch. Um, so the south here, you would have a little uh, niched courtyard, uh, this open patio area that you see right here. Can you all see my mouse? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, so that area would be right here. Um, again, this is showing a couple different roof configurations. So this has a gable in the back, a hipped roof in the front, and then you can see that projecting dormer over the porch. Um, and this one just uses the, uh, uh, a gable roof, so carrying over from what's on the existing structure and then a, uh, a small porch roof coming off of that. And you can see that in, in this design right here. And I will say we tried to keep the roof line and everything as low as possible, but my current house in most areas of my house does not meet current Florida building code uh, for finish, uh, for high elevation of height. Um, and um, 
Um, and, and obviously in the front room, uh, which is the, which will have to be modified, um, it doesn't meet the current finished floor elevation requirements in the porch because it really was an at grade porch. So are you gonna be stepping down from the front portion of the proposed addition down oh. to the existing house? Right, so my, my plan is um, to keep the porch segment intact as much as possible but I have a feeling all of the support beams will need to be reconfigured and a foundation or of some kind will need to be poured with some flooring. So I would like to retain the original structure because I have um, in that area, I have a tongue and groove wood ceiling that's original and I would like to retain that. So my, my goal is to preserve that structure as much as I feasibly can um, while shoring it up so it just doesn't feel over one day basically. <laughs> How much higher is the floor elevation going to be in the in the proposed addition than the existing? Um, so the floor elevation will will be about the same as the main structure. Um, the difference is the ceiling height um, has to be shift, and um, um, <clears throat> um, it will the floor elevation will be a little bit higher. I don't know the exact number because it's not finished strong. You know what I mean? This is very early. Um, I didn't want to pay for the guy to finish it until I had some feedback from y'all, honestly. <laughs> um, and um, also, um, as well as the, you can see that, the, can you go back to the front, Jordan, of my existing house? So you can see that the original house is very narrow. It was probably a shotgun. Um, and then the lean to addition, um, which doesn't meet anything in the building code, was added. So, um, so with the little bit of increase in finished floor elevation, but you can see the front of my house, you can see the porch, my door is basically scraping, practically scraping the floor there. Um, so that portion has to be reconfigured in some way. And then um, I would obviously want to retain the roof and the ceiling inside and all of those, that historic charm internal to it. And then we would keep, the only thing we would lose would be the front facade of that porch and all the other window configurations and trim would all be retained. <clears throat> okay, so we, um, uh, we have uh, had a very similar project to this um, that went back in 2019 um, and that was 413 North L Street. Um, it's a similar frame vernacular cottage. This one had a little bit more uh, detailing on it. It was a little bit different. It did have the clapboard siding. Um, it had a series of intact casement windows, which the property owners and um, decided to keep at staff's encouragement. Um, but as you can see up here, this was the uh, existing plan. Um, and what they proposed to do was to add a uh, connecting hallway, uh, a lower hyphen feature here, which preserved kind of this corner of the house right here. Um, and then their new addition was kind of, um, was side-loaded. Um, you can see it kind of here in the rendering. Uh, this is the older historic, or, you know, historic portion of the house. And then this was um, what was proposed to be added. Um, so kind of similar to, um, to Aaron's request. Um, we'll probably see more requests like this on um, on these types of structures or smaller residential structures that are pushed to the back of the lot. Um, they're just, they're a little bit challenging to work with um, due to their size and, and their placement on the parcel. So it's, it's kind of a good exercise for us to, um, to look at these and see, you know, what the best way is uh, moving forward to make them, you know, more livable for, a, for our time. Yeah, when I purchased the house, um, you know, I, I, I basically, I didn't have a child. So now that my child is seven and an active boy, um, we need some, we just need some more family space. And, um, you know, I considered the hallway option that Jordan had, had mentioned, um, but it wouldn't really integrated the space. I felt in a way that I felt more comfortable with as a mom. And also I would have had to reconstruct that entire wall anyway on the front and none of the windows or the doors had any historic significance. Um, and uh, in fact, they were just, it was basically an open porch with glass. Um, 
So um, that's why I made the decision to have a, a larger or a wider attachment in the front so that it really could function as a family home. How much side yard do you have on the uh, left side? Um, let me measure it. it it's uh, about it 16 like feet. Yeah. Shed or the neighbor's tool shed? So my closest neighbor in front is actually closer to the, the side property line. <laughs> that south side property line. Bottom. The bottom will be south. I see a little tool shed. Is that yours? Yes, and I want you to know that I actually have a variance for it. It's I have a variance and a permit. So. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my opinion is that you're being very conservative in what you're doing compared with what you might be able to do if you wanted. I don't, I want the house to be a family house and function, but I enjoy living in my house and I, I don't want a gargantuan house. You know, I, I'd like a family right now. My house is slightly over 1100 square feet. So this would put me around night between 1800 and 1900 square feet, depending on how we work the floor plan. So it'll be the whole house will be under 2000 square feet. I had a hypothetical question on this one because it, it kind of relates to the, uh, the first case that we had earlier this evening. And because you're, you have a small cottage on the very back of the lot, if somebody were to have something like this, and let's just, you know, again, this is hypothetical, said you wanted to build, you want to keep that as the guest cottage and build a main house. So um, that's complicated. Um, um, it, it wouldn't be what I personally would be interested because in, I'm interested in a family home and I can't have my kid be in a separate house from me sleeping when I'm watching TV in another house. So that would not be personally for what I'm seeking. <laughs> my seven-year-old might appreciate it. You know, it would be video games all night long, but it wouldn't really work for me. So to that end, it theoretically could be possible, but there's a lot of zoning requirements that I would have to meet or a hypothetical case would have to meet. There's building lot coverage, there's impervious surface. Um, there is, um, so usually when there's um, a house like that, there's usually a patio or a common area in between. Um, also too, I'm in the single family district, so I could not have two units. So really right. the um, front unit would, so I would have to remove the kitchen and it's almost too big. I think our, what is our limit on, isn't it a thousand so square feet on if ADU? I, if I can chime in and I think this would be kind of the biggest deal breaker is you're limited to 40% of the square yeah. footage of the main. And it sounds like Erin, she wants to do a modest addition. She doesn't want to keep hers and then build something that's the size of that plus 60% more. Right, right. And that's what that's really what I was asking that getting into that primary subordinate thing, yeah. to be able to build a primary with a cottage on the back on, on a property like this, where they because we do have a lot of these properties with the little cottage I, in the back lot. I will say, Chip, um, I've, I've had that conversation with a lot of homeowners um, who own structures like this. Um, and it, it is a balancing act, like you were, or like you know. Aaron and Abe were talking about, there's a lot of limitations, a lot of things that come into play and a lot of alterations that would have to happen to that existing structure to turn it from a freestanding house into just accessory space. Um, but with that said, um, it does seem like a plausible alternative for some people. Um, so that's something we're going to have to approach when one of those comes forward is, you know, is it appropriate for, you know, a historic house to have a new house built in front of it that, you know, kind of dwarfs it in size and, and what are we gonna, you know, what the review process for something like that is gonna be. And I think to George's point, any, if, 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 and once you get over about five or 600 square feet, you're looking probably with the building lot covered in impervious, you're looking at a minimum of a two-story principal structure to be able to 
you know, go up. And, and there's just so many limit, other limitations, you know. Okay. And I'm sorry to go off on that rabbit hole. Okay, can we go back to your designs? Um, on, your, on your south elevation, mm -hmm. it looks like you have a door. Yeah, it looks like you have a door on the right-hand side there. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to have, so um, my kid is really active. And um, so I need to be able to pop out in the yard and yell at him. This is also excellent for party circulation. So those are my design choices with that. So I will have a front door and then a side French door in some way so that I can quickly yell at my child to come back in or um, in my current configuration, I have two front doors. I have a front door and a side door, which I actually really love. And again, if you're entertaining and you have the uh, big yard in front, it works really well for flow. Um, so that's kind of, that's my own. If you guys hate it, you know, we can take it out, but that's my child yelling party door. So I'd really like to keep it. Okay, so does, it, uh, I noticed on the, on the floor plan, it doesn't show that door. Uh, if you go to the floor, if you go to the floor plan. Yeah, the floor plan hasn't been updated with, like, it's not all, it's not all done. So because my question is, if you do put the side door in, does it, does it more, uh, does it, is it going to favor having that door, the front door in more in the center of the, of the porch, <laughs> as opposed to having the one on the left hand side? You know, right, kind of right. So if you look at, go back to the floor plan, Chip, to your point, you can see originally I had the front door and the, the, the French door in front of the family room. So my architect, uh, at, recommended that I move that French door to the side so that I could have the porch with the railing and the single centered front door. So the floor plan, I haven't paid to re-update yet. That was like my initial kind of concept to work within generally within the footprint. When you guys see the full package, it will all be consistent. Well, and then, and you're looking for our input. So, I mean, that's what I was trying to mm -hmm. get at. Um, if it, it seems to me that the mm -hmm. option F is is going to be something that, you, that you're you're going to be happy with. Number one, it carries on the gable end. Uh, it doesn't go with a hip roof. It goes with a gable end on the roof. Puts the door in the middle, and then you can have your your French doors on the left. So I mean, if if you're asking me what would go along with the house that you've got there, I would say I would say option F. Yeah, and 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 I'll just bring up that there's two schools of thought there, you know, there's the school of thought. I personally like the gable because I think it's super cute, but um, William also brought up that the hip roof would be distinctive from the existing structure. So it's really up for you. I don't care what kind of roof y'all want. I will put whatever you want on there. <laughs> you know, I will do whatever you want. <laughs> so it's really just what the consensus is on and how you want to go forward. If you want the post moved, if you want the whatever you guys want, that's what I want to do. It's very symmetrical. Uh, the door will be in the center, though, on the floor plan. I think that was an old option. So really, it's really option E, option F, option H. And, and then um, also, I will mention that if you guys have another, you want to modify an option and you say, hey, I like this, but I think you should move this here. That's, uh, that's the feedback I'm looking at tonight. Erin, on your south elevation, can we go up to that picture again? I just had one question. Mm -hmm. uh, the back and the front, on the top picture, the back and the front roof, the bottom levels of them are even like the gutters. And on the bottom one, the front structure's roof where the gutter would be is higher than the back. Yeah, the structure in the front is going to has to be higher than the back because okay. the structure is wider. Um, because if you, the original structure was a narrower with a lean to, um, but it's difficult to replicate that structure and meet the, the Florida building code requirements or without a much more costly, um, it, it, it really bumps up the cost to, to replicate that a lot for me because I have to do custom, uh, custom everything. So I would prefer to keep it, um, you know, like this simple because we're already looking at probably for me around one hundred and thirty thousand um, dollars for this. So I try not to like make it. I'm trying to keep it so I can actually build it. <laughs> we work already, in government. <laughs> I work in government. This is already going to be a big honking loan for me. <laughs> do you have any parking on site? I do. I do. Um, so 
Uh, can you pull up uh, the aerial of my property? Do you have that? So mm -hmm. actually I have a driveway um, behind um, a poor driveway behind the, um, behind the shed oh. and with the rear alley access. So I believe um, I will need to add a one parking place, which I would actually, if you have some input on, I want to do strip parking, one single space and in the front, because I prefer to keep my front yard garden. And I don't know, it might be better to put it next to my neighbor on the north end who already has a car there and kind of consolidate the cars together. Or if you want it on the south end, but I know my neighbor on the south end would really prefer not to have that car there because she's got a really lovely garden and um and I have talked to both of my neighbors about this idea as well I say put it on the south side <laughs> we, we discussed that a couple we, a couple months ago where if you had the ribbon driveway you, you can't have to run into the house it has to be side loaded it has to be side loaded again mm -hmm. yeah it would be all the way to the property line but the problem is is that even with the addition um I don't have a place to put a, so if I'm required to put a second car, um, if you would prefer, I can, we can look and see if a historic waiver would get, give a waiver so I don't have to have two parking spaces. I, I honestly don't know the answer to that. So, but I'm going to comply with whatever I'm legally required to do. Um, so that's my goal. What is your foundation? Uh, the door is right there at grade. grade level. Are there steps up or is the mm -hmm. house? My so foundation starts inside my house. So that's actually my old porch. And that's what I was saying is that that structure there, the lower structure needs to be probably completely redone. There is no foundation there. It's, I think it's just post basically on grade. Because sure. when, when my front door slams, the wall wobbles. So it needs to be reconstructed a little bit. And I have a full stoop inside my house. Oh, okay. So. How about the rest of the house? Is it on center blocks or on a- Yeah, it's on piers. It's wood on piers. And I have some, you know, um, when I did the addition um, in the back, they found, um, you know, some old cypress and old Dade County pine. There's some really cool. And my ceilings and my principal structure are Dade County pine tongue and groove, mm -hmm. wide plank. They're just really lovely. So I'm, I, I really, I definitely enjoy living here. Mm -hmm. Even though my kids driving me a little bit crazy with, you know, with, with the video games. <laughs> I could use some mama space. <laughs> Does anyone else have options on the on the? I think look. I mean, a preference on any of those those spots. I like the you. I like F. I I agree with F. I like F. Yeah. It just. Which one is that? It's cozy. Yeah, it's a top or right. right. Yeah, upper right. Oh, that's the, that's a little. I, mean, I think that's the least of our issues. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a matter of taste. You say. Well, why don't you guys spend some time on if? I mean, is there consensus on F? Um, is there not consensus? I think that that's probably what we need to solve. I I don't think that's. I don't think it's our decision here. No. But, yeah, I don't think so. I mean, I actually like the the gable end. I without the. I like the gable end without the. Um, What's that the bottom? Well, I mean, that's that's an attic space up there. I'd rather see. It'd be nice if you could put that that uh, vent back on the house and on the wall of the house and and uh, put a lattice or something up in the gable to make it really like an outdoor room. Do you know what I mean? Rather than a, a low ceiling space. Well, above the porch. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so to yeah. do that, I would have to change the pitch of my roof um, to make it more functional. So. Um, Really what I did is I, I told my design professional to keep the pitch low to match the pitch of the house. So that's why you're seeing what this is. Um, they had originally put like almost, it was almost a story and a half with the pitch, which would have given me a lot more storage space, but I didn't feel as comfortable with that because I was worried that it would shift it too much. So if you feel like that's okay, I mean, yeah, but I, it would I, make it a lot taller than what is currently proposed here. This is I don't really I'm not, yeah, I'm not talking about I'm not talking about the storage space. I was just saying that the front porch, I think would if it's if you're gonna bring the gable out like that mm -hmm. over the front porch, it would be nice if the gable were very lacy above it. You know, I mean it would be diaphanous, not a hard wall. Then you put that vent, put that vent back on top of where the windows are. 
but the front part of the porch could just be this sort of lightweight structure. You could put a fan up there. It'd be a pleasant space to be. Nice idea. Nice so you're idea. saying like put an outdoor space on the porch or something above the porch? How, how deep do you want this porch to be? It, it's not going to be very deep. It's just going to be like four feet. So I'd really prefer... You yeah, why not make it a real space? You have the room. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would definitely take advantage of that. I'll tell you, I was very nervous about coming here, so I wanted to keep it as small and little as possible. <laughs> I, I understand that. In fact, did you say you've got you've got a budget of one hundred and thirty thousand dollars to do the to do this project? Yeah. So some of that is going to go into the the original house because I have to remove my existing kitchen. Um, I have to relocate um, my uh, utility room. I'm going to turn my kitchen into my washer and dryer utility room. Um, and then I have to basically kind of reconstruct the office area, the front porch area to support that. Um, so I, I'm just kind of, you know, I'm just, construction costs are very high. So I just am trying to keep the scope, but I would love a bigger porch. So if you guys are good, and I have to say option G is my least favorite. So I like option F and I liked option H the best. Those were my two faves. So. Well. Oh, you could extend that. You've got a hundred and thirty thousand dollar budget, and you've got a contractor who can build it for that right now. Sign the contract immediately. <laughs> I'm going to GC it myself. Knock on wood. So, <laughs> I have some. I have some really good subs, and um, so I have a shell contractor, and uh, so I can't do it with a contractor You're right for that. Aaron, as far as the porch is concerned, I got a house smaller than that. I love my front porch sits back and it's covered and I got to swing up there and I sit up there and I have my martinis and yeah. I, I'm open to a bigger porch. You guys tell me what you want. I mean, like literally tell me, order it up. Okay. Are we talking about a deeper porch? Yes. Deeper. Deeper. Okay. Deeper. And Aaron, it also, like, from things that I've been looking at as far as market, it's going to give you market return. If you have a large functional porch, but I just think you're going to regret it further down the road if you don't have a functional porch on there. I'm I, I was keeping it small for y'all. If you guys are good with more, I'm good with more. You know. I think it'll, it'll help the house. I mean, if you have a little more, a little more shadow. I think it would go with the style of the home. I mean, going like yeah. by my office built in 1912 or whenever, that porch is 10 feet deep. Yeah, it gives it kind of that, that bungalow aesthetic. You can fit a lot of furniture out there. Yeah. So, so are we? Do we have consensus either F or H? Do you do you have a, a thought about which one you would like better? Can we? You want to vote? Like, so we just kind of get a vibe. Like, who wants F and who wants H? All these are workable. I think the one. I, I think all of these elevations are workable. I mean, correct. A certain they all have a certain logic to them. So I think it's whichever one you like. Yeah. Which one's more you? Um. You know what's me is having a living room and a family room and a new kitchen. That's me. <laughs> Either yeah. one of these will work for me. Like honestly. <laughs> yeah, the, only, the only comment I had was G would put the two doors too close together. So the center, <laughs> center door was which is what you want anyway. Yeah, uh, I want the center door um, for sure because that's what we've discussed. And and so um Either one is fine. All right, so I'll just, um, I'll think about it. I probably would pick um, F, honestly. Um, yeah. If, just in terms of economics, it would be a lot less expensive if it, was, if it were a straight gable and you weren't dealing with a hip. Right. So um, so do you like the, the shape of the, the vent? Is the circle good? Would you like a square or a rectangle? Or do you have a vent preference? That's your decision. That's your I, I, I don't care. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> what type of siding are you thinking about, Eric? So I want to do stucco because really the house was originally built. It's interesting, Jordan, I looked at the property file. It was originally built with stucco siding, which is super weird, right? So right. <laughs> well, let's, let's, move on. Right. let's move on to the planning issues. Uh, well, this planning issue A, Historic Resources Board training. Okay, uh, so you're good with this? If I bring this yeah. back, you're you're good? We'll massage it? 
Yes, ma'am. Yes. All right. Thank you. That is what awesome. we're from. Okay, let's get on with this. <laughs> who's, who's presenting the planning issues? Jordan, Jordan is. Yeah, so I'll be handling this tonight. Um, so we're just going to do, um, I know a lot of you all are kind of new to the board. So this is just a kind of a brief training. Um, it's got a little bit of, uh, you know, kind of hit the history of the preservation movement in the country, um, kind of what you all do, why you do it, what tools you use, and your kind of duties and powers. So just uh, bear with me. It is um, pretty short. Um, and if you have any questions, just uh, just ask, okay? All right, yep. Okay, um, so I'm not gonna spend a tremendous amount of time going over kind of the early advancements of uh, American historic preservation, but if you haven't, I'd really encourage you to kind of look back and read some literature on the beginnings of preservation in the United States. Uh, there's some really interesting characters and activists and local ordinance put in place relatively early uh, by communities that realized their architectural heritage was a crucial part of their identities. Uh, but for, for some brief highlights, uh, the Mount Vernon Ladies Association uh, was the first national historic preservation organization in the United States. And its efforts in preservation set an important precedent and have served as a model for many later organizations. And this organization was started by Ann Pamela Cunningham in 1853, shortly after she took a riverboat trip down the Potomac and uh, witnessed George Washington's Mount Vernon in a state of ruin. Um, and after being denied money from Congress and the Virginia legislature to purchase and restore the estate, uh, Cunningham and a small group of women um, were able to independently raise $200,000 uh, to purchase the estate and begin restoration efforts. Uh, but Mount Vernon is still owned and operated by the Mount Ler Vernon Ladies Association, and it's organized currently as a private nonprofit. Um, you'll see in the center here, uh, Charleston, South Carolina, uh, enacted the first zoning ordinance in the country in 1931 uh, to try to regulate compatible development on the peninsula. Um, but the demolition of important community landmarks are typically what started the preservation discussion in many cities throughout the country. Um, additionally, uh, the proposed demolition of the Isaiah Davenport House in Savannah, Georgia, to make room for a gas station uh, spurred the creation of one of the nation's first historic preservation revolving funds. Uh, and this was started in 1959, and the Historic Savannah Foundation's revolving fund is nationally recognized. Uh, and they've saved about 350 historic buildings in, the, in Savannah's landmark district. Uh, but HSF raises and borrows money to purchase uh, endangered historic buildings, stabilizes and secures them, and attaches protective covenants to them, and then they sell them to preservation-minded buyers. Um, and any proceeds are placed back into the fund and recycled to save other buildings. Uh, but the uh, Isaiah Davenport House is uh, their headquarters, and I was a docent there for a little bit in college. Um, but it was really kind of the fate of two train stations that brought about national solidarity with the preservation movement in this country. Uh, the demolition of Penn Station in New York City, uh, which was an incredibly ornate Beaux-Arts masterpiece by McKim, Mead, and White. Um, it was very controversial and, and caused outrage even internationally. Uh, but the controversy over the demolition of such a well-known building is often cited as a catalyst for the legal basis of the architectural preservation movement in the United States. Uh, but kind of a short story, uh, the Pennsylvania Railroad, who owned the station, uh, sold the station's air rights in the 1950s, and Penn Station was proposed to be demolished and replaced by Madison Square Garden, uh, while the underground portion of the station would remain. Uh, but the developments kind of caught the public off guard when the news appeared in the New York Times and uh, protests were mounted against the destruction of the building, but with no lawful protections. Uh, the demolition proceeded in 1963, uh, but the loss of that building and, and from public pressure uh, caused then Mayor Robert Wagner to create the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission in 1965. Uh, but kind of unfazed by the experience of demolishing Penn Station, uh, the Penn Central Railroad Company uh, looked to make Grand Central Station as profitable as possible. 
Um, and the company solicited the modernist architect Marcel Brewer to design an office tower to sit on top of Grand Central Terminal. Um, now, the Landmarks Preservation Commission denied issuing a COA for the, propose, or for the proposal, and the railroad sued the city with the argument that the ruling was unconstitutional and that it was essentially a government taking, resulting in the loss of a reasonable return on private property. Um, but after multiple legal battles in state courts, uh, in 1978, the Supreme Court ruled in a 6-3 uh, favor or favoring the landmark law. Uh, and in the opinion of the court, uh, Justice William Brennan wrote um, that the New York City law does not interfere in any way with the present uses of the terminal. Its designation as a landmark not only permits, but anticipates that the appellants may continue to use the property precisely as it has been for 65 years. Um, so the law does not interfere with what must be regarded as Penn Central's reasonable expectation concerning the use of the parcel. And most importantly, we must regard the New York City law as permitting Penn Central not only to profit from the terminal, but also to obtain a reasonable return on investment. Um, so how's that for your um, design review? Do you think that would fit in uh, our design review criteria? Um, okay, um, but in the 1960s, um, American cities were being uh, kind of fundamentally redesigned under the Urban Renewal Program, uh, which was started by the Kennedy administration. Uh, and this process was intended to kind of help modernize and update cities by clearing away large swaths of, um, you know, kind of neglected or neglected historic city centers in order to make room for new interstates, modernized housing projects, and modern services. Uh, but the process really ended up destroying the fabric and the unique development history of a lot of our cities. Um, Interstates inter were allowed to bifurcate urban cores and old but affordable housing uh, was demolished and the density in a lot of these areas were often reduced. And it really caused the widespread displacement of the poor and minority communities that lived in these areas. Uh, but pictured on the side on the slide, you can see downtown Denver in the 30s and then in the 70s uh, after its historic city center was essentially gutted to make room for surface parking and future development. Um, so in the 1960s, you kind of see these epic battles between government officials and community organizers. And most notably between activist Jane Jacobs and Robert Moses, who was the New York City uh, Parks Commissioner, um, but Moses had proposed a new Lower Manhattan Expressway, and it was going to be a 10-lane elevated highway that would cut through Soho and Little Italy, and it would destroy Washington Square Park and, and kind of that, that whole uh, center of the city. Uh, John, or Jane Jacobs was a community organizer who led protests and challenged officials in, in very high-profile meetings. Uh, she was even arrested once for provoking a riot. Uh, but in 1961, she uh, published The Death and Life of Great American Cities, uh, in which she challenged the concepts of, of kind of modern automobile-centric urban planning. Um, and she said, she kind of listed what made, uh, made good cities, and that was smart growth, mixed-use facilities, small city blocks, and sufficient density of people and buildings. And she argued for the protection and preservation of historic buildings and historic city plans. Uh, if you haven't ever got a chance uh, to read that book, it's phenomenal. You can get it on Amazon for next to nothing. And there's a couple documentaries about uh, Jane Jacobs and Robert Moses, which are fascinating and, and really worth your time. Uh, but kind of seeing a need for the federal government to take the reins and provide guidelines and a nation, nationwide apparatus, uh, President Lyndon Johnson con, uh, convened a committee on historic preservation, and their report, named With Heritage So Rich, uh, became a, um, <clears throat> a rallying cry for the preservation movement and won widespread bipartisan support. And the Preservation Act of 1966 was passed that year, and it kind of gave us the framework that we still use today. Uh, the law requires individual states to take on uh, responsibility for their historic sites and their jurisdictions. And each state is required to have a SHPO or a State Historic Preservation Officer uh, that's required to complete an inventory of important historic sites. 
Uh, the law also created the President's Advisory Council on Historic Preservation and the National Register for Historic Places, uh, which is an official list not only of individual buildings and structures, but also of districts, uh, objects, and archaeological sites. Um, additionally, and this one was important, uh, federal projects or those using federal funds were now subject to what became known as the Section 106 review process. And, uh, and, that, and that's kind of uh, determining whether the work that's going to be done, whether it's a highway, a railroad, communications equipment, things like that, um, would harm a historic site, and if so, uh, tries to try to figure out ways to mitigate that. Um, but the Preservation Act of 66, like I said, still gives us our regulatory framework. Um, so the ACHP, uh, it's an independent federal organization, and it's charged with promoting the preservation of our country's resources. Uh, the ACHP advises the President and Congress on national historic preservation policy, and also provides a public forum for um, stakeholders and the public to influence federal agency decisions regarding federal projects and programs that affect historic preservation. Uh, the president, of course, then makes policy directives and the Congress passes laws which are enforced on a federal level by the Department of the Interior through the National Park Service. And the Department of the Interior also creates our standards and our guidelines regarding historic preservation and the National Park Service issues preservation briefs and monitors federally owned historic sites. Um, but at a state level, uh, the State Historic Preservation Office, uh, which in Florida is the Florida Division of Historical Resources, um, set, it sets state policy, um, it keeps the Florida registry, um, it advises county and municipal preservation programs through the Certified Local Government Program. Um, and Lake Worth Beach is a certified local government. And what that means is that the state has essentially accredited our program and they review our board meetings and COA decisions. Uh, they review and comment on any proposed changes to our ordinance. Um, and being a certified local government also allows us to compete for state and federal grant monies. Uh, for things like resurveying and creating educational materials, um, but statewide nonprofits like the uh, Florida Trust for Historic Preservation um, are also eligible to apply for grants. Uh, but I think this is an important <clears throat> thing to note here, is that through all of this framework, the real protections and teeth of historic preservation in the United States comes at the local level through local ordinances. Uh, the federal government is not really in the business of telling private property owners what to do with their property, so they've delegated that responsibility to state and local governments, um, thinking that, you know, people in their communities know what's important to their communities. Um, so what that means is that you can have your property listed to the National Register of Historic Places one day, and you can turn around and demolish it the next. The National Register is an honorary listing. Um, it provides no protections, but locally designated properties that are governed by local ordinances are where you get your protections. Uh, so Lake Worth Beach created our historic uh, commission in the 1990s, and most of our districts were surveyed in the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, the district boundaries and contributing non-contributing findings that were established in these surveys uh, were adopted by ordinance for each district. Uh, so within districts, you'll, again, you know this, have uh, contributing properties and non-contributing. Contributing properties are those that generally fall within the period of significance for a historic district, uh, which in Lake Worth, our periods of significance are about from 1915 to 1945. And these properties also display or exhibit certain um, prominent architectural types and retain a fair portion of their original building materials and character defining features. Uh, Non-contributing resources are properties that generally fall outside of that period of significance or buildings that have been severely altered or have had incompatible alterations over the years. Um, now Lake Worth Beach is a, is a historic city. We have many buildings that are located outside of official historic districts that could potentially be evaluated for a historic designation. Uh, but without a designation, um, they're not really regarded as historic and uh, they don't really fall or they're not really protected by, by anything 
you know, any kind of local protections. Um, so the National Park Service provides the criteria for historic designations, and then we have our own local criteria. Um, so something isn't just historic because it's old. Um, it generally has to meet at least one of four criteria to meet a significance threshold. Um, so in the opening sentence here on the slide, um, the Park Service states what we're looking for, which is um, significance in American history, architecture and archaeology or culture. And it says kind of where we look for it. And that's in districts, sites, buildings, structures and objects. And then they provide the seven ways to measure significance um, if, uh, in integrity of location, design, setting, materials, workmanship, feeling, and association. And you'll hear us discuss these in the staff reports from time to time uh, when discussing the state of a building. Um, so Lake Worth Beach uh, chose to implement our historic preservation program through districting. Uh, which is really the best way to preserve the feeling, um, the setting, and the design of a geographic location. Um, other programs like, like Palm Beach operate, on an individual, operate more on an individual designation or landmarking program where individual structures are protected, but the surrounding structures may not be. Um, and there are different reasons to go with either. It's really just what suits a community best. Um, but Lake Worth Beach's districts are largely adopted under Criterion C, and our districts are not protected really for any one single structure. Our buildings are mostly modest structures without a whole lot of wow factor. But when you place them all together in a community setting, uh, they embody distinctive characteristics of early 20th century planning in South Florida. And our building stock has some excellent representations of certain types of period architecture, which tells a great story of how the city was planned, how it was developed, and why the city developed at the time that it did uh, during the Florida land boom years and the post-war housing years. Um, so once you determine that you have historic sites, uh, you need something in place to protect those sites at a local level, and that is done through a historic preservation ordinance. Uh, ordinances are generally always based on the Secretary of Interior standards for historic preservation, and they're typically integrated into a city's land development regulations. And ours is section 23.5-4. Um, and an ordinance should really tell um, you that your preservation commission or that your board um, that they're the gatekeepers for your historic resources. And it should tell you what their responsibilities are. Um, it should tell you what the community goals are. And it should say what is protected and how it's protected. And it should give you the review criteria that should be used in your decision making. Um, now, Lake Worth Beach um, has also spent a tremendous amount of time crafting our design guidelines which are city specific guidelines for the preservation of our unique resources. And these are incredibly important. Um, our design guidelines were also adopted through resolution um, and they are in full force and effect as if they were adopted by ordinance. Um, they are just kind of by their nature, part of our code of ordinances um, and such hold as much weight as any other land development regulations. Um, so for additional supporting materials, like I was saying, um, we have our design guidelines. You all are pretty familiar with those. Um, we also have our major thoroughfare design guidelines, and those are more of a zoning tool, but we do have major thoroughfares that run through our historic districts. Um, and these are really a set of design parameters and recommendations for development within a district or a specific point of interest. Um, so they're intended to help developers and designers kind of understand and implement, um, you know, a principle or kind of what we want without restricting their, restricting their um, you know, creativity. We also have the Historic Preservation Education Guidelines, and these are a guide to um, property owners regarding sustainability, resilience, and building expansions as new projects are planned. And the document outlines concepts and different terms and programs which provide more information for property owners who are interested in enhancing the sustainability and resiliency of their historic properties. 
Um, we also have our historic, or, or excuse me, we also have our surveys, um, which are a crucial tool um, as they kind of provide you with an up-to-date inventory of your historic assets. Uh, so before we get into your specific responsibilities, I thought we'd do a quick refresher on some terminology. Um, so historic preservation is an umbrella term uh, for similar preservation related practices. But preservation is in its truest sense, a very rarely used treatment um, of which there are four. Uh, so preservation as a treatment is the act or process of applying necessary measures to kind of to sustain the existing form of a historic property. And what that means is that the act of preservation is leaving a property exactly how it is, performing the very slightest maintenance to keep the property um, in a perpetual state of sameness. Um, and one of the best examples of preservation as a treatment is Drayton Hall in South Carolina, which is arguably one of the finest examples of 18th century Palladian architecture in the country. Um, but now the, or the hall was the uh, primary plantation of the Drayton family, and it's located on the banks of the Ashley River in Charleston. Uh, but the house was deeded to the National Trust in the 1970s by the descendants of the Drayton family. And their decision, a decision was made to keep the structure exactly as it was when the Draytons gave up the property. Um, so it has not been furnished. It has not been improved in any way. Um, if paint chips off the walls, it's picked up and re-adhered to the plaster. Um, so preservation is a treatment where you literally kind of seek to freeze a property in time. Um, another treatment is reconstruction. Um, and that is the, um, the act of new construction where the form, the features, the detailing of, you know, kind of mirror that of a, of a non-surviving site for the purpose of replicating its appearance for a specific point in time. Um, now we have a lot of reconstructed historic sites throughout the country, but nothing really kind of comes into comparison to Colonial Williamsburg, uh, which is an entire city that was reconstructed to depict how the city would have looked and functioned in the late 18th century. Um, if anyone is looking for a vacation to a heritage site, um, Colonial Williamsburg is in dire need of money, so check them out and maybe plan a trip. Um, but restoration is another treatment, and that is the act or process of, of accurately depicting the character of a property as it appeared at a particular point in time. Um, and on the screen, you have James Madison's Montpelier, and this is um, probably one of the most ambitious restoration projects in the country in the last 50 years. Um, but James Madison's home had been privately owned outside of the Madison family for many years and most recently by the DuPont family. Um, but when they granted it to the National Trust in, 19, in the 1980s, the foundation underwent a major restoration uh, to remove all of the additions and alterations that had happened over the years uh, subsequent to James Madison's original design. And they spent about $30 million and re removed about 30 rooms to restore the building to its 1820s appearance. <laughs> um, the last one is rehabilitation. And that is, that's what we see most often. So that's the act or process of making uh, compatible uses for a property through repair and alterations and additions while also still trying to convey the historic nature of the building. Uh, this is also known as adaptive reuse. Um, the example shown is of a late 1930s Art Modern Greyhound station um, on Broad Street in Savannah, Georgia. Uh, the building had set in a state of disrepair for many years and was uh, purchased and rehabilitated into a restaurant uh, utilizing state and federal tax credits. Um, I worked on this project when I was in Savannah, um, and you can see the, the beautiful vitrolite panels that cover the front facade. Uh, so those had all been stripped off, um, except for one of the blue panels remained under a cornice piece that had been added in, in later years. Uh, and that panel was sent to Pantone's research department where they came up with a color match and had the new panels uh, baked at a cost of, of well over $100,000. Um, 
So back to you all. As a board, um, you have a lot of responsibilities and you're really making decisions for historic preservation, for building code, um, and also zoning regulations. Um, so when you have your preservation hat on, you're predominantly performing a design review to issue COAs, you know, kind of what you did all evening. Um, you'll review them for exterior alterations like roof replacements or window replacements or things like new construction or additions. Um, and you also are able to grant historic waivers and Florida building, excuse me, building code variances. Uh, but these are often waivers for building division requirements that are only granted for historic structures, as we talked about earlier. Additionally, you serve as the zoning board for all parcels located in the historic districts. So for things like new construction or additions or maybe even putting in a new driveway, um, you're kind of accustomed to reviewing things like lot coverage, setbacks, impermeable surface, you know, all of those are zoning restrictions uh, located in the land development regulations. But additionally, outside of, you know, historic waivers, uh, you may also be asked to review, um, you know, zoning variances, which have different criteria and may be used when a historic waiver isn't the appropriate solution. Uh, but on larger projects, uh, which we have a few in the pipeline, um, you're going to be asked to look at major plan developments. Um, major site plan amendments, um, but you also have LDR incentives such as sustainable bonus and transfer of development rights incentives. Um, you've also heard rezoning requests and um, you also review and recommend comp plan amendments to the city commission. So you have a, you have a tremendous amount of oversight and responsibility um, and you all have you know, you all have the review responsibility and authority of the zoning board, plus the added historic preservation components. Um, but generally kind of, you know, all of your review takes place during design review of a proposal. Um, and the city has specific criteria that is outlined in every staff report for specific topics. Um, there are visual compatibility criteria specific to additions, uh, new construction, and exterior alterations. And these are your guidelines um, and what you should legally be basing your decisions off of. Now, staff will always outline the criteria and provide you our best answers for them, but it's okay to disagree with staff's analysis and, you know, to have your own discussion on criteria. Um, so in looking at you know, successful design guideline or successful design review, what that looks like. Um, again, you should be following the compatibility criteria provided in your staff reports. Uh, you should be considering the significant character defining features of the architectural style or property and how those elements are being impacted. Uh, you should consider the significance of the structure and its impact on the surrounding district. And, um, you know, the proposals for things other than new construction should be falling into one of the four treatment options that we kind of discussed earlier. Now, for what an unsuccessful design review looks like, um, you should not be making decisions on arbitrary standards. So you should be impartial and following your, your review criteria. And one of the major problems where boards can run into uh, trouble is, you know, when we act as the pretty committee. Um, and this happens when, you know, our personal preferences for certain aesthetics take precedence over our standards. And all preservation boards have struggled with this and do struggle with it. Um, but I like to say that, you know, typically if you follow the standards and the criteria, you, you generally end up with a handsome looking project. Now there is rarely a one size fits all approach to design review. Um, what works for a certain structure or a certain architectural type may not work for another similar project. So we have to evaluate everything on a case-by-case -case basis while keeping an eye on precedents that we've set. Now you can make decisions that break with past decisions and precedents, but you need to have a, a good logical and clearly justifiable reason for doing so. Um, and we have our certificate of appropriateness process. 
And um, certificates of appropriateness, that's your historic preservation approval. It basically states that the scope of work proposed is compatible and appropriate for the resource, you know, provided the standards and criteria for granting the COA are met. So we'll just briefly kind of run through the process. Um, at the top bar there, that's when the applicant submits. Um, staff will review that application. Um, we'll perform our own administrative design review, and then we'll kind of um, look and see if the if the project is is compliant with the LDRs or with the design guidelines. And if the application is incomplete or not in accordance, um, we'll fail that and ask for a resubmittal. Um, but projects that you know. Um, are complete, uh, we'll look at our CROA approval matrix. And that matrix is a, a list saying what has to go to the board, what can be reviewed by staff. So if it can be reviewed by staff and it's um, an, an administratively approvable option, uh, we'll grant the administrative COA. Now, Abe and I process about 300 administrative COAs a year. And that's window replacement, roof replacement, siding replacement, you know, things like that. But if it's in compliance with the design guidelines, it can be permitted administratively. Um, things that uh, go to you all when the HRPB reviews the application, um, you know, you all will issue a denial um, if the project isn't compliant and, they, and the applicant can either resubmit with something new or they can appeal your decision to city commission. Um, there's also the continuance, which we heard the second round of one tonight, where you all can request more information. Um, and then there's approval or approval with conditions. And after that happens, um, a development order is drafted um, stating, you know, what the project is, all of its conditions of approval, and the chairman signs off on that. Um, and then the applicant is free to uh, move on to permitting. Okay. Okay. Um, now, I know we've gone over a lot this evening, uh, but I do want to make you all aware of um, kind of the tools and items on the city's historic preservation webpage. Um, Abraham and Keith have worked very, very hard to make our webpage kind of a one-stop shop for all of our, you know, um, Jordan has to reshare his page. That's what yeah. that is, is happening. So. Um, as you can see, we, we threw a lot of information at you this evening, um, and thanks for staying with us and hanging, you know, everything from base flood elevation to historic preservation training. Um, go ahead, Jordan, talk about the webpage. Okay. Am I on the right page? Can you see it? You are, you are. Okay, excellent. Um, so on our historic preservation webpage, um, we do have our design guidelines, which, you know, we spend a lot of time in. We also have the education guidelines, which that's the sustainability and resiliency guide. Uh, we also now accept online COA applications. Um, so you can do that here and submit electronically. Um, we also have a lot of our important documents. Um, so our COA application, if you're still wanting to submit in hard copy, uh, you can do that. And we also have all of our checklists for, um, you know, different projects that someone might go into. Um, we also have our historic preservation map, which um, I'm not sure if you all are too familiar with. Um, but you can just type in an address. You spelled ocean wrong. I sure did. <laughs> so, but he's going to show you something interesting here. Um, so this is, so it will take you to the property. If you just select the property here, um, it provides all of your zoning information too. Um, provides your address, your PCN, what your zoning is, your future land use. Uh, it tells you um, what historic district you're in, you're in, or if you have a contributing or non-contributing status. You also have a link to property appraiser and a link to your um, legal description. But in addition to that, um, I think you closed. Jordan. I sure didn't. It's under business. Yeah. Um, we also do have up and running our. Um... Here, I'm planning and zoning. Is that where you want to be? 
No. There, look on the left, the left, the left on the bottom. Yeah, there. there we go. Um, we also do have our historic property file search. Um, now, again, in the um, in the grant that we were able to able to do, um, we were only able to get um, a couple hundred or about a thousand properties. We did College Park and the majority of Northeast Lucerne, um, but we are currently in the midst of scanning the remaining historic district files. Um, so at that point, you know, anybody is able to um, get onto the server, uh, select their property, and look up their, um, you know, their historic permitting documents, any original blueprints, anything like that. Uh, and you also do have really great search criteria. So in the search bar, you can search for Art Deco buildings from 1930 by a particular architect and it'll populate all of those fields. Uh, so we've tried to make everything as easily accessible as possible. Look at that cute little guy. Um, exciting stuff. <laughs> but that uh, that kind of ends out my uh, my spiel. Uh, if you have any questions or Erin, if you'd like to take it. Um, if the board has questions, if not, I have one brief thing before you guys wrap up on planning items. If you do you have any questions for Jordan? Nice presentation, Jordan. Yeah, yeah that's that great. Good. Excellent. Thank you. We're really lucky to have both Jordan and Abe on staff. They're exceptionally qualified um, and um, with their degrees and their experience um, in this field. So we're, we're quite lucky with the staff that we have. So um, I guess I'll go ahead and move on. And um, what I just wanted to touch on is, is, I just wanted to let you know what's going on um, as far as applications and volume. And really surprisingly, um, we have had a tremendous increase in volume and applications, and in particular, very large applications for investment in the city. So, um, you know, just um, uh, one of the reasons why I want to bring it up is one, we're very excited and we're, we're doing everything we can to be more efficient, but also too, if you, if you don't, if we don't pick up the phone immediately, it's not that we're sitting around not doing anything. <laughs> we are cooking with gas <laughs> is the only way to say it. So um, please leave a message or send us an email and we'll get back to you. Um, we're just experiencing an incredible uh, surge in applications and particularly large ones. So first, I just wanted to show you the data that I pulled very quickly comparing 2019 to 2020. So overall, we had a 13% increase in applications. This was both for, this is planning, zoning, and historic preservation um, type applications. So we're, we last year, calendar year, January to December, we, we pulled in 531 applications. Um, we have four staff members. Um, so um, if you look at our site plan increase, uh, typically we run maybe 16, maybe 20 on a good year. Um, last year we did 52, we did 16 the year before, that is a 225% increase and site plan applications. This could be anything from a site plan amendment to add a small addition to, or a, or a small area to a, a whole brand new site plan for commercial. Um, we also had an increase in conditional uses, which you guys have seen those before. And then we had four plan development applications last year. Um, and I will add, typically we see, um, Peter tells us we see anywhere from like in the mid 200s to maybe just a little over 300 in building permit applications. In January, we took in 400 building permit applications. So you figure about of the building per permit applications, about 40% of those get reviewed by either Abe, Jordan, Alexis, or Andrew, one of the four. So in addition to this work, they're also um, reviewing 40% of all the building permits that come in as well. Um, so just to kind of give you a snapshot, I will also add that we've already received three new plan development applications in January, and we're expecting a fourth as well. Um, um, so these are just applications, not completed projects that have been approved. So, um, so we're busy <laughs> and we're happy we're busy. So just, um, but let people know if, if um, just send us an email or leave a, a lot of times, sometimes we get a call and people just keep calling. They won't leave a voicemail. So definitely leave a voicemail if you call. So. Well, Aaron, thank you very much. Jordan, 
Yeah, thank you. Abraham, it's amazing to see all of the resources that we have in the city and uh, it looks like a very promising future. It's a very, we're very excited, um, you know, to see the activity and, and also to see the infill in the historic districts is really amazing. Um, you know, I think just in Parrot Cove alone, we've seen almost every vacant lot I can think of on Ocean Breeze. I think nearly from 10th Avenue North all the way to downtown, I think near, almost nearly every vacant lot has been filled in in the last few years with new homes. Um, so it's just really, it's incredible. Wonderful. Thank you very, very much. Are there board member comments at this point? None for me. Nope. Yeah. Mr. Dorenzo, any comments? All good. All right. With that, can I hear a motion to adjourn? I motion to adjourn. Moved, second. seconded. We are adjourned. Go Thank home and have a great. glass of wine. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.